and Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, good, good afternoon, uh, folks. I'm going to make a, a start uh, on the meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank those members that are joining by uh, Starleaf. We have uh, Pat Sheehan, Doug Beatty, Martina Anderson and Emma Sheeran. I do see that we have Trevor down in the audience. Um, I don't know if we can get him uh, bumped up into the spotlight. Uh, Trevor is here. Um, Trevor Lund is here and we have uh, Christopher Stalford who's just stepped out of the room for a moment. Um, given that there's only myself and Trevor Lon in the room. I'm just going to run through those couple of housekeeping things that we normally go through beforehand. Um, nothing, not giving away any trade secrets or anything what we talk about before we actually start the meeting, but just to, to, to remind members that today's business is uh, a briefing by the First and Deputy First Ministers on the executive response to COVID uh, and other general departmental issues. Um, that we will then get an oral briefing from TEO officials on the assessment of the impact of Brexit on the institutions and North South East West relations and an oral briefing by the Executive Office officials on common frameworks. Uh, before we move on, can I take this opportunity to welcome Michael Potter, who is our new clerk of the committee. Uh, Michael has taken over uh, just as we've returned back in January and uh, already hit the ground running. We've had a few meetings with various groups, sectoral groups, and uh, we've done the preparations for today's committee meeting. So we've got a, f uh, a full team here. Um, Michael, we welcome you on board for the committee. So thank you for coming along. Um, if, that, if members are happy with that, we will progress then to uh, apologies. We've received no apologies at this stage uh, for the meeting. Um, if I could ask members then for item two, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of December at page five. Are members content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings of that meeting? Yep. Okay. In terms of matters arising, there's just a few matters arising from it that I need um, a steer from the committee. On page 11 of the meeting pack, there's a response from Michael Gove uh, to the committee's letter on the 11th of November, where we asked for written evidence on governance of the withdrawal agreement post-transition, the joint consultative working group, dynamic alignment with the protocol, influencing EU policy, common frameworks, and the treaty and trade negotiations and intergovernmental re relations. Could I suggest that a copy of that is forwarded to all statutory committees and the AERC and to the other legislators as we have discussed with them throughout the last term? Okay, yeah, yeah. agreement to that. Uh, and also, could I get agreement to respond, to uh, acknowledge the letter and to write to the department to be kept informed of this engagement? Would members be happy enough with that as well? Yes. Okay. On page 18 of the meeting pack is a response from Michael Gove to the committee's letter of the 4th of December regarding the Westminster Finance Bill. Uh, are you content to note that? Yep. Okay, and on page 20 of the meeting pack is a letter from the House of Lords European Union Committee to Michael Gove seeking clarity on the Northern Ireland Protocol in relation to trade. And it's important just for us to note that as well. Yes. And then finally, uh, sorry, not finally, but page 22 to 23 of the meeting pack is communication between Michael Gove and the House of Lords Committee regarding future parliamentary scrutiny of EU policy and, and laws. 
pages 24 to 28 of the meeting pack are responses to the House of Lords European Committee on Commission Work Programme and the Single Customs Window. These responses were copied to the Assembly European Affairs Manager as it was felt that these would be of interest to our committee. Are members happy enough to note all of those? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, members, then we'll progress to item four, uh, which is the presentation from the First and Deputy First Minister, the oral briefing. Uh, if I could refer members to page 31 of the meeting pack for the relevant papers. And the First and Deputy First Minister are in attendance via Starleaf and will brief us on the response to the COVID pandemic and to other general updates from the department. So hopefully at this stage we will have uh, Arlene Foster, First Minister, Michelle O'Neill, Deputy First Minister, um, just as ever the precursor that the session is being recorded by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the committee web page. You're very welcome. Happy New Year to both of you and thank you for coming along today. I'll maybe pass over to yourselves and then we can open up the questions after that. Yes, yes, indeed. Maybe a bit faint there, Arlene, but maybe. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, that's better now, yes. And I, I'm just going to see if my. Is that better? Okay. So I, I want to thank you, Chair, and obviously members, for the opportunity to give an event from our last appearance, which was way back in July of 2020. It has, of course, been an eventful period, and whilst in July we may have had some growing optimism about the prospects for a return to normal business. The subsequent resurgence of the COVID-19 has meant that it has continued to dominate and shape our work. That's not just in relation to the effort required from our direct response to it, but it also forces that an on our capacity to take forward other areas of business. And I know that the committee takes close interest in the range of our business, and we're happy to take questions on any and all issues that members have. However, in the time available, there are a number of key developments over the past six months on uh, which it might be perhaps useful to focus. Um, the US, but of course, uh, victims and survivors, program for government, and um, new decades. I'm going to hand over to Mr. Yeah, and just. Just Arlene, that, that, that is just, it's still very faint. and. I'm, I'm not sure if it is an issue, but I know with those types of headphones, the microphone does need to be very close to your mouth to pick up things there. So I don't know maybe if moving it a bit closer would help. Um, sorry, Michelle, back, back to yourself. Okay, and hopefully my sound's um, okay. Loud and clear. Okay, thank you. So also just to say thanks to the members of the committee for the opportunity to brief you across a wide range of issues um, today. Um, this week also obviously marks the first year or the anniversary of the restoration of the Assembly and the Executive and um, the focus on, on COVID um, from, I suppose, the early uh, restoration uh, was both unexpected and then obviously unavoidable. And I don't think that any Executive uh, Committee has faced such a major challenge, especially so soon after the return of devolution back in January. And it has, without doubt, um, tested all of us uh, in many, many ways. We're very grateful, obviously, for the support of the committee um, throughout the pandemic. Um, COVID is clearly our priority, but nevertheless, it is important to note that despite all the pressures that there has been, um, significant achievements in other areas and the, and the remainder of the mandate, we hope to build on, on those things. Um, the First Minister has suggested an approach to discussion today, and we're happy um, to hear and to respond to what members have to say. Arlene? Okay, so um, we're going to start then with Brexit matters. The um, committee is aware that the UK and the EU reached on the 24th of December on the future relationship. Um, the future relationship bill received royal assent on the 30th of December, ratifying that agreement into domestic law in the UK. And while, of course, there are differences across the parties and the executive, there's also a consensus that it was in no one's interest to leave without a deal in place. Therefore, it's welcome that a deal has been reached. It's clear that this is a complex agreement uh, and will require careful scrutiny by all departments and ministers over the coming weeks. And it's also much wider than just trade agreement, which I think we all know it's a wide range of areas from transport to security. Its implementation will be a challenge uh, and most likely an evolving process. So it's important that we understand the impact and, and opportunities that the agreement will provide 
particularly in rebuilding our economy following the COVID pandemic. Whilst it provides for a zero tariff, zero quota deal, it does not mean that things will remain as they were. Uh, and that's evident from the first few weeks of trading uh, that we've seen. Uh, and the agreement will be implemented and operate alongside uh, the protocol. And there will be interactions between both that will need to be carefully monitored. And of course, the same difficulties with the operations of the protocol at present. And I'm sure we'll come back to those uh, in the course of this year. So undoubtedly significant progress has been made in terms of the protocol and in the future relationship agreement with the EU. However, it's clear to us all that there remain some operational issues which have the potential to impact significantly on our economy and on our people. And we are committed to ensuring that these are resolved as quickly as is possible. As I'm sure committee members are aware, businesses have indicated that there has been a disruption to goods coming here from Britain and that's for two uh, main reasons. The first reason being that the companies um, on the British end weren't prepared for the changes in processes associated with the protocol and therefore at a low level of readiness. And the second reason is that agri-food goods were usually transported as part of the grippage or, or the transport of mixed loads. So that's a major issue for our hauliers who operate to tight margins and turn, turnaround times and worked in the single market but may now or may not now work in the post-transition arrangements. So the grippage, grippage issue also affects smaller companies who are not benefiting from the grace period for supermarkets. And we also are seeing impacts of the lack of preparedness of British businesses on the Hollyhead to Dublin routes. So we can see just in terms of problems, that's where that is arising. Most of these issues have obviously resulted in lorries being displaced, which impacts on the ability to send schedule loads from here to Britain because the trailers are not back from Britain and then this causes the viability issues which all of our businesses have been uh, voicing over the course of um, the last number of weeks. We have stated very clearly to the Chancellor um, CDL um, that these impacts need resolved at a rapid pace and we continue to raise our concerns at daily meetings of the Exit Operations Cabinet Committee that we or junior ministers attend and through officials working with their um, Whitehall colleagues. We also have assurances that um, Revenue and Customs, Department for Transport and the Border Delivery Protocol Group are increasing their engagement with British companies and they're working to find creative ways to reach smaller businesses to ensure that there's a greater level of readiness. Our officials are liaising with their counterparts also in Dublin and the Irish Government to resolve issues which are mainly related to the absence of customs declarations and we will continue to press the British Government for resolution on across all of these issues. Um, maybe before you come in there, um, Arlene, I think we are, we're still struggling with um, to hear you. I don't know if it's possible maybe just to, to remove the headset and just use whatever microphone there is on there. I know in particular Christopher Stalford can't hear you and he does hang on every word that you say. And I think he's, he's quite keen that you, you can be heard. So. No. 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 There's no sound, darling. Oh, okay, well, maybe just. It might, it might help if it's re plugged in again. Brilliant. No warning, still no sound. No. No. Or do you want to? Do you want to? I don't know, take maybe another piece of business and then come back to us, or does that? Yeah, maybe we could take we'll take a five minute break, sure, to, to allow things to get sorted out. We're, I'm happy enough to do that. We'll just we'll take five five minutes. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room Thirty. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room Thirty. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly I, I'll just make, bring the, the, the meeting back into live session again and we'll pass back over to the uh, First Minister who's going to continue with the presentation. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, the next issue that we wanted to address with the committee, it was in victims and survivors. And in terms of the appointment of the Commissioner for Victims and Survivors, we've concluded the consideration of options for that post and have now instructed our officials uh, to commence the process for the appointments of a Victims Commissioner. Uh, the appointment process, of course, must comply with the Code of Practice for Ministerial uh, appointments and uh, we've asked officials to draw up terms of reference for review to be completed within six months of the office of the commissioner and those two are, are currently uh, under consideration. Michelle. Her. This really is a joint office, isn't it, Michelle? We can't hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, we've got yeah. you back again. Yeah. Apologies. Um, so we have, or as I said, we're, we are committed to meeting the needs of um, bereaved victims and survivors, and indeed the groups themselves have highlighted concerns, particularly in regard to acknowledgement of the trauma the bereaved victims have experienced. So our officials have been exploring options to address the need to acknowledge what bereaved victims have suffered which could be delivered by the Victims and Services Ser or Victims and Survivors Service. And we're currently considering um, these and we'll reach a decision shortly. So then in terms of the Victims Payment Scheme, um, Justice Minister has indicated to the Assembly that her aim is to open the scheme to applications in early March. Uh, a substantial programme of work is underway uh, with the Department of Justice, however, more work remains to be implemented before a scheme of this complexity and magnitude can become operational, but progress to date includes ongoing development of an online system to receive applications. Uh, a tender process for the appointment of an assessment service provider will conclude shortly. Uh, NIJAC is at an advanced stage of the selection process for an interim victims payment board. Uh, accommodation has been secured. Uh, Department of Justice officials in conjunction with TEO continue to engage with all of the relevant bodies regarding evidence retrieval processes and fortnightly engagement meetings continue to be held uh, with the sector. In terms of uh, the interim president, the Lord Chief Justice has announced the appointment uh, of Mr Justice McAlinden as the interim president of, of the payments board. If I can turn then just briefly to his, uh, historical institutional abuse, um, at the end of December, uh, the Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Board had received 959 applications for compensation. Uh, the board has made determinations totaling £7.38 million pounds and paid out £5.76 million of redress. The new president of the board is Mr Justice Ian Huddleston, who was appointed on the 8th of January uh, as part of a periodic reallocation of judicial roles. Um, the previous president, Mr Justice Adrian Colton, is returning to the courts to take on the role as the lead judicial review judge. And of course, we would want to acknowledge the key role he has played in establishing the scheme, uh, the first payments for which started to be made just seven weeks uh, after the scheme opened. And just to say that I'm very pleased to confirm that Fiona Ryan took up her post as commissioner um, on the 14th of December, and her role will be, to, will be to represent the best interests of all of the HIA victims and survivors. There's no doubt that she has got many challenges ahead, um, such as work on an apology, a memorial, and ensuring that proper support services are put in place. 
So I'm sure we all want to take this opportunity today to wish Fiona well in her new post. A new package of support services was also launched with VSS, WAVE and Advice NI on the 1st of December. And that includes additional psychological therapies, complementary therapies, support for social isolation, support for people experiencing persistent pain. And to date, 82 survivors have registered with that service. Okay, and something very much in the news today um, is the mother and baby homes and the Department of Health, of course, is the lead on mother and baby homes and ministers are naturally concerned at the findings in the report by the Commission of Investigation uh, into mother and baby homes. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I are meeting with Minister O'Gorman next Wednesday, uh, the 20th, to discuss the Commission's findings and in particular any issues which have a, a cross-border dimension. The Interdepartmental Working Group on Mother and Baby Homes, Magdalene Laundries and Historical Clerical Child Abuse, which has been chaired by Judith Gillespie, is currently considering the findings and recommendations of that report. So the, re the research into historical mother and baby homes and Magdalene Laundries here commissioned by um, the Interdepartmental Working Group and undertaken jointly by Queen's University and by the Ulster University, I'm glad to say, is complete. And we understand that a paper will be brought to the executive shortly for consideration and then subject to the executive's approval. It's intended to publish the research report before the end of this month, so the end of January. Alongside the publication of the research report, the executive will also be asked to consider and agree recommendations on the way forward. Uh, the chair of the group has, that, um, has established a reference group, um, and that includes obviously a reference group of victims and survivors and also their representatives. And they clearly have to play an important role as um, in, in terms of this work program. And then finally, Chair, the programme for government and uh, a significant amount of work has taken place um, to develop a new outcomes based programme for government. Uh, the programme reflects the dependencies and connections that exist between the different strands of public policy. Uh, the programme is something that we can all contribute to and which has a clear focus on the things that matter most to people, of course, health and happiness and life satisfaction. Uh, but it's also one that will provide a sound and lasting basis for designing, shaping and delivering public services so as to achieve the best possible outcomes on societal well-being. Uh, at our meeting on the 22nd of December, uh, the executive agreed a draft outcomes framework for use as a starting point in a public consultation. Uh, about the direction of the programme for government and we expect that process to launch very soon. Uh, we will of course share the document with the committee as soon as we can. Uh, our officials will be able to say more about the PFG development process and consultation when they attend committee next week uh, uh, when they're coming to provide an update on NDNA matters which of course includes uh, the PFG. Then in relation to the work that we're doing to develop the new outcomes based programme for government it's important that we get the wording of the outcomes right. And that is the critical first step, and that is why the executive is seeking to achieve, or what it's seeking to achieve in the forthcoming public consultation. The new draft outcomes framework is only the beginning of the conversation, as the committee knows, a starting point for discussion and, and I've no doubt for debate. The framework sets out draft wording of the outcomes and incorporates some early thinking um, around what the key priority areas might be under each one. The executive is also committed to working in a very joined up way to put in place impactful strategies and actions that tackle our most intractable problems and to deliver real and lasting change in the things that matter most to people. At the end of the consultation and when finalised, the new framework will provide a basis for a longer term policy plan by the executive and act as a touchstone for all strategies and actions in moving forward. That's our opening um, remarks, Chair, so okay. over to yourself. Yep. Th thank you very much indeed for that, and I'm glad that we've got our technical heads sorted and we're, we're up and running. Um, I'll maybe start, um, as you, we've said, it's July was the last time really that we had the chance to catch up via the committee. Um, so maybe if I could ask a question just that, about public messaging in terms of COVID, uh, and public messaging and behaviour has been uh, critical to prevent the spread of coronavirus in our communities. but. Do you feel that the behaviour of politicians has reached the standard asked of them uh, by the public? I mean, does you know going to London when the advice suggests that we don't help? Does going for long distance walks well away from your home help? Does not wearing face masks help? Does attending large scale events help to curb the spread? 
you know, do you think that using your veto uh, in the executive to prevent the necessary and essential lockdown uh, that was required and the lack of wits has undoubtedly led to the further spread of the virus in our communities? Did, did that help? And I suppose maybe just to ask them, do you regret some of the decisions that you've taken and do you feel that you need to apologise to the public for asking them to do what evidently some in the political cohort have been unable to do? So thank you for that question, uh, Chair. I think um, we should all remember, including everybody on this call, the politicians are, are human beings and we're like the rest of humanity and uh, decisions are made which people uh, probably need to reflect on uh, in, in the future. Uh, however, uh, I will say, uh, if you're making a political point about uh, members of my party going to Westminster, they are representatives like you are. You're in the Assembly today. Uh, you've travelled up to chair a meeting, uh, and of course that's essential work and needs to be done. Um, uh, Michelle and I have decided to not do that today. We're coming in remotely and we can see all the difficulties that are attached to all of that. Um, it is very challenging for all of us to try and continue to represent the people that put us into these positions, whilst at the same time making sure that we send out very strong public messages uh, around COVID and the need for us to stay at home and to do uh, what is right at this time. Uh, in terms of the uh, veto, as you will know, it's a uh, me mechanism that has been put in uh, by the Belfast Agreement. Um, there were no changes suggested to that uh, in the new decade, new approach, uh, and therefore it, it is something that is open to three members of the executive to call for. Uh, at that particular point in time, um, you will recall that uh, we were trying to give hope to uh, hairdressers, people who were really under a lot of pressure, small coffee shop owners, uh, and the decision was around whether to allow them to open for a week uh, or, or not. I don't regret that uh, because I think when you look at other jurisdictions and you see uh, what has happened right across uh, Europe and indeed the world, uh, none of us could have foreseen the, the severity of what was coming down the tracks towards us. And that's what we're having to deal with now. I think that the executive uh, and those of us who lead parties within the executives have always strove to have a proportionate and balanced approach to dealing with COVID-19. Uh, hindsight is a wonderful thing uh, and we can look back and say there are things we should have done or things that we should not have done at all um, in, in this past year but there will be plenty of time for reflection. I think what we're, in, uh, we're involved in now is trying to make sure uh, that we lead uh, uh, Northern Ireland in a way that gets us as quickly out of this dreadful situation that we're currently in at the moment. And it is not without hope, Chair. I am delighted to say that Northern Ireland is leading the United Kingdom in terms of the vaccine rollout. It's wonderful to see that going so well. Uh, our positive case numbers uh, from a high of over 2,000 is now falling and today is at 1,145. But that doesn't take away from the fact that our hospitals are under incredible pressure at this moment in time. And therefore, there's a lot that needs to be done uh, by those of us in public life to get messages out to people that they should stay at home as much as possible at present. The only thing really to add to, to, to that is I think that there will be plenty of time um, to concur. Actually, in this point, there will be plenty of time for reflection. Um, and I think that given the challenges that we face right now, we have to very much be focused in the here and now. And that is the situation that we have, that um, our health service is under huge pressure. Um, our healthcare workers are under huge pressure. The system is on the brink of collapse. And we took the opportunity yesterday on the joint platform on the hill of O'Neill and Dungannon to just reinforce that message of stay at home. And we'd ask the committee for your support in doing likewise. Um, I think that uh, some of the work that we're involved, with, uh, involved in as the executive um, particularly around the work of the task force. We very much look to strengthening the communications. Um, we have our own, obviously, internal executive information service. We have all different departments trying to deliver on their roles within, uh, in terms of their response to the executive. But we very much feel that in terms of looking to the future, looking towards um, getting us through the here and now, looking towards the recovery piece, that strategic communication was going to be a, a really key part of that. And, and I'm glad that we've been able to commission some work around the strategic communications and we're actually working with SIB to be able to help us um, to move that forward. So in terms of today's um, committee appearance, let, let the public message be very clear from the uh, from myself and from Marlene as um, First and Deputy First Ministers that um, our uh, 
joined up message is to the public is to please stay at home and let help us get through this next number of, of weeks and try to alleviate some of the pressure that's on our health service as we deal with what is probably uh, what we are in now, this period that we're in now, which is probably the worst position that we have been in the whole way through this pandemic. This is all of the the, the nightmare predictions that, that were initially talked about back in March, all the um, worst case scenarios that were modelled. We're now actually living that. So um, I think for for today, the message certainly is the message of please stay at home and limit your movements as best you can. Okay, thank you very much for those um, seven, seven separate questions that there were in that last question. I think no was the answer to all of them. <laughs> um, so if I could ask then, what, what message do you have um, to the large multinational supermarkets who really are stretching to the limit their ability to sell non-essential goods when the regulations clearly state that, that they shouldn't? I mean, how, how do you think that local traders feel whenever they are prevented from selling items, yet their customers can go to larger retailers, often in the same town, and get the non-essential items from there? I mean, I think they would like to be able to hear those traders, that, that you would understand the hurt that that causes uh, to many of them and their mm -hmm. businesses. And as a question... Is a mere guilt trip going to cut it with the larger retailers or will you regulate to, to stop this from happening and ensuring, uh, I suppose, as it is, that there's a coronavirus retail level playing field? Well, the executive is working our way through through this and, and it's more than um, mere um, threats, I think maybe is what you called it, or uh, guilt trip. Um, guilt trip. Um, it's more than that. We're actually looking at what else we can do because we do... Uh, and we've had this discussion at the executive, all executive ministers have, including your own ministerial colleague, um, where we've been chatting out what else we can do to try to bring this in and regulation if there is a way for us to do that. Uh, it's not straightforward, but we, are, we absolutely recognise that smaller retailers are being disadvantaged because of larger retailers um, taking liberties. So if we, we will discuss this again tomorrow with the executive and we also have a roundtable um, discussion um, scheduled for Friday with major retailers around this very issue, which obviously is, is very topical. No one should be, none of the smaller retailers who are doing the right thing um, um, and complying and, and keeping their doors closed, they shouldn't be in any way disadvantaged um, in terms of the, the larger retailers who are perhaps exploiting um, the, the, the flexibilities that they currently have. But if we have to regulate them, that's what we will do. Yeah, thanks, uh, Michelle and Chair. I mean, I think we've always approached this, Chair, um, in the recognition that what we're asking people to do is something that ordinarily we certainly wouldn't. And we've always asked people to work with us in a partnership. And that's true of whether it's been the churches uh, or whether it's been with local government uh, or with the health and safety executive or the police. And that's why we're bringing people together uh, to have that conversation because we would much rather people recognize their moral duty in all of this because it is wrong. And I've already said this in the chamber, it is wrong that small independent stores that are, for example, selling clothes are told to close by the executive. Yet those big multinational stores, which also sells clothes as well as essential goods, are able to continue to do that. And I don't think that's fair. It's not right. It's not equitable. Um, and it's discrimination. So we will look to... Um, those companies to take action. They have already taken action, some of them, by saying that uh, they're going to enforce the mandatory wearing of uh, masks. Uh, a little late for our liking, but still they have decided to do that and we welcome that. So we would ask them to also look at um, their responsibility as large retailers to the rest of the economy in Northern Ireland, because it is not right uh, that those uh, small independent retailers who are receiving stock in for spring and summer now still have a lot of stock left in terms of their winter stock. So we absolutely agree that something has to be done and uh, we will approach this uh, meeting on Friday to try and deal with these issues. I, I think that would certainly be welcome because there are, in terms of the moral outrage, I think there's even some examples of larger retailers closing down sections within their shop 
to make sure that the majority of what's open is actually essential and then that allows them to sell essential and non-essential. And I think that that has been particularly hurtful to the, the small retailer in the local uh, towns uh, right across Northern Ireland. So uh, I think the movement on that would, would be very welcome. Um, Minister, you, you've mentioned already about the um, report into the mother and babies issues here and that there will be a report hopefully by the end of the month. There is a, a small perception out there that maybe there's been quite a delay in this report and I was wondering if you could explain to us if there is a delay, what has caused that and that if you feel that if the report warrants it that there would need to be a, an apology uh, and even a public inquiry if required into this issue here in the north. Uh, just to, to sort of acknowledge the significant damage uh, and emotional hurt that has been caused as a result of that. Is that something that you would commit to if the report suggested it? As I said, uh, we expect to receive the report um, by the end of the month. And I know that a lot of work has been um, taken forward by Judith Gillespie and her team in terms of working with the actual victims and survivors. They have to be to the core of any decisions around what happens next. So I believe the, the executive will have this report by the end of the month and I look forward to getting that and actually turning around a response um, very, very quickly. I think um, what happened in the South yesterday was appalling that that report was in any way leaked, um, that it was leaked um, to the public before the victims and survivors had sight of it. I think that was a further slap in the face and just we need to make sure that that doesn't happen here. We need to make sure that the victims and survivors are the first people to know and we need to make sure that we take them with us. So whatever is asked in terms of the, the report, then um, I will respond accordingly and, and no doubt um, Arlene will feel the same. I mean, it's really, really important that victims and survivors are at the centre of whatever it comes next, whether that be um, whatever is recommended by, by the report itself, whether that be a full public inquiry, whether that be an independent investigation, whether that be um, a statutory investigation, but whatever that may look like, um, I, I'm prepared to do whatever is required to make sure that these people are no longer, these women are no longer denied um, the access to, to justice, which is what um, they require. So whether that be an apology, whether that be um, investigations, whatever is required, then um, I am determined to, to do that. I think, Chair, it's important that we reflect that um, what happened in mother and baby homes and in Magdalene laundries isn't that far back in our history. And mm. um, I think it is atrocious when you read some of the accounts of forced adoption and excess deaths that took place um, to those young mothers. And it is very traumatic um, to look at that. So I, I can only imagine the trauma that uh, some of those children who were adopted uh, by force uh, fail now, and indeed the fact that they haven't, um, in some cases, been able to trace um, their mum um, because of issues around data as well uh, in the Republic of Ireland, which I think um, needs to be looked at as well. So look, I mean, I think Judith Gillespie, since she came in as chair, uh, has made great progress. I, I think both Michelle and I were very taken when we met her recently. Uh, by her energy and determination to get to the truth. Uh, so I very much look forward to her report. And whilst I totally understand that some people will call for a public inquiry, I think it's also uh, recognised by others that because this is such a, a personal issue uh, and such a private issue that others may not want that to take place. And so we listen to all of those arguments and, and hear what Judith has to say to us in relation to what is the way forward. Uh, and uh, as Michelle says, we will want to take that forward, whatever that is. Okay, thank you. F finally, from myself then, um, do, do you accept that the, the empty supermarket shelves and major delays that there is to the Hollier firms is a direct result of Brexit? No. It, it is, it's what parties such as mine had warned about all along. And there was an opportunity for the UK to remain in the single market and the customs union and enable also the UK to meet its obligations to other agreements such as the Good Friday Agreement. Yet some of the usual no, 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 nevers were heard and here we are. So can I ask, do you feel that the current situation that we're in is a price worth paying for the freedom that you feel Brexit was going to offer us? 
Well, of course, Northern Ireland is not uh, having the freedom that we should have under Brexit because of the protocol. Uh, and of course, your party calls for the rigorous implementation of the protocol uh, instead of trying to deal with the huge difficulties that have arisen because of the protocol. So I regret that uh, deeply. Um, Michelle will have a different view, of course, on Brexit. But let me say this. I think there are opportunities for us. It is a gateway to opportunity. But only if we deal with the iniquitous protocol, which is causing so much difficulty uh, to the people of Northern Ireland. Chair, just a, as you know, we don't have a, a shared view on Brexit. And um, you know that my view personally is that there's nothing good to come from Brexit and that we've always known all along it comes with um, huge challenges. We also know that the people here voted to remain. So um, we have been taken out of the EU against our wishes. I think what we're experiencing largely in the last number of weeks has been a, directly as a result of, um, if you want to call it a trade and adjustment shock. Um, it's very clear that because of the lateness of the deal and the detail of the deal, that on the British side there has not been um, preparedness and the operational readiness has not been to, to where it should be. It's very clear that businesses on this end um, have been very ready because of the major implications for our businesses, but certainly um, from speaking with the business community, um, and from dr speaking directly to hauliers, for example, it's, it's very, very clear that the major issue of operational readiness in the British side has, has not um, been where it should be. And then we also have the other issue of groupage, which I referred to in my opening remarks, which is also causing problems. I am pleased to say, however, that um, our officials have informed us that the major retailers, Floor Fresh Food, for example, is now above... 95% of the norm. So um, our food flow is obviously continuing to uh, improve daily and should hopefully be back to um, where it should be. So I think that um, the reality of businesses in Britain not being ready for the new trading realities and now we're bearing, that's our businesses are, are bearing the brunt of that. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pass on now to the Deputy Chair to Doug, Doug Beatty, if he can come in there. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair. I, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, um, uh, Arlene, Michelle, thank you very much indeed, and, and Happy New Year to uh, you and, and to the whole committee. Happy New Year. Um, it, you know, there's an awful lot going on, and where I can absolutely see that nothing can stand still and nothing should stand still, uh, and we're talking about Victims and Survivors Commissioner and, and the historical institutional abuse, uh, mothers and baby homes, and the programme for government. Um, I was just going to focus on, on two things, um, and, and that was COVID and, and Brexit, which I think are, are the two defining things at this moment in time. And I just wondered if, if both of you, the First Deputy First Minister, can maybe give us a sense, please, of where we, you see us in regards to the COVID lockdown. Um, I, I know you are due to do an assessment on the 21st first of January, um, uh, and, and, and it's due to end on the 6th of February. But I'm just wondering if you, if you could sort of get, maybe just sort of give us your sense. I know it, that, that in w one breath we, we're saying that there's not much else we can do in regards to lockdown, and, and in the other we're saying, well, maybe there's other measures. Or, but I'm just wondering, is it, what's your sense? You know, are we likely to, to spread on to the end of February like the CMO believes, or, or, or where do you see us, us coming out of this? I think it is hard to say at this stage just where we're going to be in the sixth. However, we do know that we're in a desperate situation. Um, as CMO and, and, and Ian, the Chief Scientific Advisor, have, have all stated publicly, it is the case that we looks like we're on the other side of the, the peak of the number of cases. So we're coming down in terms of the number of cases for now because of obviously the restrictions that are in place. However, we haven't reached our peak in terms of our hospital admissions and that's where the huge pressure is being felt right now. We had an executive meeting on Tuesday and I put it directly to the health minister, just is there anything else that we need to be doing to help in the here and now, particularly taking the pressure off the hospital situation. And there was no recommendation for additional measures, for example, right now. Um, but as we know, throughout the whole of the pandemic, this is a very fast moving situation. And sometimes um, you have to move um, according to the, the current prevailing situation. Um, we, we will review the restrictions again. Um, if and, and if they're needed for longer, then they're needed for longer. Um, if we can lift anything, then that's also what we will do. But I think um, as we speak today, it's very hard to be to give any kind of certainty around what post the, the sort of 6th of February will look like. Um, if you're basing it on today's situation, then you'd say that, that it could be for longer. But I think we just have to keep an open mind um, as to what happens next. And 
and then work along with the public health advice whenever it's given to us. Yeah, so just to add very briefly, Doug, I mean, I know people want to have certainty and we hear from different sectors quite frequently the fact that we haven't uh, given them certainty. I wish we could have certainty. We haven't been able to have certainty now for a whole year. Um, it is hugely frustrating. I, I'm on record many times of saying none of this is inevitable. Um, it is down to personal responsibility and, and taking the actions to cut down on social contact, uh, to make sure that we're not putting pressure on our National Health Service. Uh, today, our COVID inpatients has reached the grand figure of 869. Uh, that's incredible. We were nowhere near that on the first wave. I think that's actually double, uh, if not more than double, where we were on the first wave. Uh, so the pressure on our health service is immense. Uh, and I do want to take the opportunity to pay tribute to the resilience and the determination of our healthcare workers, whether they're ancillary workers, whether they're nurses, whether they're doctors or consultants. They have all stepped up, and you could see that at the weekend when the call went out from the Southern Trust and the Western Trust in relation to come in, please, we need your help, even if you're off duty. So look, we will have to recognize the work of our health heroes uh, after this is all over in a meaningful way. We know that, and we're gonna to have to step up and do that. Uh, and I think the whole assembly would want us to do that as well. Uh, and, and I think you're, you're, you're right, um, First Minister, and thank you both for that. But, uh, and I wasn't trying to sort of, to, to hold us to a, a, a time frame or anything like that. I suppose the big concern with people out there is one, of course, we want to get business and, and society open again. Of course we do. But I guess there's also that fear that we do what we did earlier, and that is we open too soon or too quickly, and then we have to go back into it again. So I guess there's that fine line that has to be that has to be sort of danced along uh, just to make sure that we, 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 we sort of look at this in slightly longer term than in the next two weeks or the next four weeks and just make sure that we've we've got things um uh, in place um if i can ask the second question um please uh, and, and this will be the last one because i know others need to, to get in this but i mean i've, I've got to be honest I, it it does annoy me that anybody is gloating about food or any other shortages uh, in Northern Ireland, whether you're pro-Brexit or anti-Brexit, nobody should be gloating that our shelves are empty because the people who suffer from our supermarket shelves empty are the ones who go in to buy the cheapest food um, and they can't get it. So nobody should be gloating about this. Uh, and, I, and I hope people don't, but it is a fundamental problem. And we, I met with Hospitality Ulster yesterday and their supply group. And what they said was, I thought was quite stark is, is that, you know, things were bad, but it's a good job we're in lockdown because if we weren't in lockdown, there would have been 10 times um, worse. Um, but what the Irish government did was they tweaked the, 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 the customs checks and the regulations, very small amounts, just to be able to sort of free up that back, backlog uh, into Irish ports. Is there no way we can do something similar here in Northern Ireland? To, to, to clear that backlog and just make sure that flow is coming through um, slightly better than what it is now? Yeah, so Doug, you're absolutely right. No one should be gloating because it's um, people on very low wages who will be hit hardest in relation to stores like Iceland not being able to get their goods through. Uh, and I think that that's absolutely right. Um, in terms of um, looking for solutions, which is what I'm currently trying to do, looking for solutions to all of these things. Um, I'm pleased to say that today the government have confirmed that they have a solution to the VAT on secondhand cars issue, which I, I have been working on because I think that that would have been incredible to double taxation essentially for people who are buying cars from Great Britain. So that, that has been dealt with. But you're, you're right, uh, we do need to find solutions for some of the issues that Michelle has mentioned in terms of groupage. I understand that the uh, DEFRA minister is looking uh, actively for solutions there and hopes to come back to us in the near future around that, around pet travel, which may seem like something that shouldn't uh, be uh, something of annoyance, but we all know that it is, uh, particularly with assistance dogs, for example. I mean, we have to be able to have those dogs trained to come over here to help people who are partially uh, and totally uh, blind. Uh, and so therefore, we do need to seek solutions. It's why we need to keep pressing the government. You have rightly identified the fact that the Irish government were able to 
tweak uh, uh, and make relaxations, why in heaven's name can't our government do that uh, for internal traffic within the United Kingdom? It should be very easily done and we'll keep pressing the government on that issue. I think there are a number of challenges that need to be addressed and that's why these meetings are happening on a daily basis to try to get the resolution um, point and there has been some progress but there is some things. I think there's a lot of unintended, or sorry, not even unintended, um, unexpected um, situations that are occurring. For example, this year, manufacture, or this week, manufacturing companies have um, just realised that they're going to have a 25% additional charge in terms of buying steel. I mean, that is a huge implication for anybody's trading um, books. So this is something else that needs to be resolved. So we have been very much um, pushing for solutions. And certainly, um, I don't believe anybody can gloat on any of these things. I think it's about these are the realities of Brexit. These are the things that we're warned about, but they also are the reality for now. And, and given that they are, we have to find solutions to make sure that our businesses continue to trade, that we have um, steady supply of goods and services, and that those things continue into the future. Uh, and if I can maybe just add something on to that, just get your thoughts on this, um, because I raised it previously, but clearly within the UK, we have uh, we have commissioned the, the Oxford-AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, um, uh, and they haven't in the EU, and whether that's okay now, wh what happens come the end of this year if the EU has not prior, if they haven't commissioned that, that Oxford Seneca? Uh, I mean, are, are we putting in contingencies if we have to, to, to get another um, load of vaccines from somewhere else because the EU won't let that into Northern Ireland? Because it's a category one good, isn't it? Yeah, the, yeah, and... Um... The health minister has actually written to uh, Michael Gove about this, the fact that we need priority uh, for our medical um, shipments coming across. Obviously, the vaccine is the one that comes to mind, but there are many, many others uh, as well that need to be given priority. So we just signed off on that. I think it was this week, Michelle. We, uh, we give the go-ahead for that letter to go to Michael Gove, and it's important that we do get priority uh, for our medical goods and devices because... Um, obviously, we need to be able to protect our citizens within the UK, uh, like any other British citizen. Okay. I... Yep. Okay. I think we're we're finished up there with uh, Doug. Then we can move into the room to Trevor Long. Yes. Thank you very much, Chair. I wish both ministers a happy New Year, <laughs> a better one than last year. Um, the, just to go back to the question of steel and second-hand cars, uh, I heard Michael go before I left to come here today, <laughs> making a, a good announcement about second-hand cars. He's very definite about it. He, he, he didn't seem quite so definite about the situation around steel and the prospect of tariffs being imposed on steel. Now, he did say something about marginal ag agreement and there could be a refund or it could be a relaxation of that. Are we, are we fairly certain that uh, that situation has been resolved? Because I didn't think it was definite enough. On, on the steel issue, I don't think it has been resolved yet, Trevor. I think it's something that we have to continue to work on. Um, certainly, it looks as if we have found uh, a solution on uh, VAT on second-hand cars. But um, I, I think the steel thing really only came into our vision uh, very recently. Um, uh, uh, this is the issue where steel comes into uh, GB, a tariff is paid, but then uh, if it comes across to Northern Ireland, there's another tariff imposed uh, because it's going back into uh, GB again, and we're seen to be uh, making goods in terms of the single market for goods here in Northern Ireland in the European sense. So we have to get that sorted out uh, um, because as Michelle says, manufacturing companies just would not be viable if that uh, was to come to fruition. Yeah. And just to add, I mean, I think you're, I think just to con, uh, concur with what Arlene said, I think that what Michael Gove said today um, promised something on steel imports but didn't go as far as to say what the solution is yet. So I think there's a bit more work to be done. Um, we'll be meeting um, Michael Gove actually I think later today as well mm -hmm. and, and certainly probably repeatedly over the coming days. So um, we'll be making sure that we raise this given the significance to the manufacturing industry and um, even particularly it's Red Cross the North, of course, and um, Arlene and I both represent constituencies that are very high uh, manufacturing industry and, and actually produce some of the largest or uh, vast majority of cushion and screen uh, equipment for, for the whole of Europe. So it's, it's detrimental to all those businesses. Yeah. 
Just, just on the, to continue with Brexit, uh, the supply chain to retailers in particular, uh, I, it's no, no surprise that I'm totally against Brexit and I wish it never had happened. But I don't think that the, uh, the effects of it are working out to be quite so serious in terms of stocking supermarket shelves and so on as we might have thought. I mean, I, I was in a major supermarket last week and it was very obvious, there were a lot of bare shelves. It was worrying. I can only say that somebody close to me was in the same supermarket this morning. And uh, two, close, I hope. two things she noticed, my wife, and uh, <laughs> two things she noticed was that the shelves were well stocked again. And, but she did, didn't recognize a lot of the brands that were on the shelves. And the feeling would be that our, our business is doing what business always does and adapting to circumstances and finding a way and a lot of the stuff was actually coming up through the Republic of Ireland rather than across the RSC. So, well, yeah, there go are ahead. two things, Trevor. Um, in terms of the um, shortages that we've seen uh, last week, I think some of those were related actually to the French blockade, uh, which was nothing to do with Brexit and everything to do with COVID. You'll recall just before just before Christmas in the New Year, the French stopped lorries from going across because of the fact that they said they needed a a, a positive or a negative rather COVID test and so that took some time to work through so we lost a couple of days yeah. uh, and that has now fed its way through because we're at the end of the supply chain and we've seen the evidence of that so it's not all uh, protocol related but that piece has now been uh, rectified. In terms of uh, other uh, goods on our shelves uh, I did notice that Sainsbury had uh, taken some of the spar products into uh, there are shops in Northern Ireland. I don't see that as a negative, Trevor, and I, I want to tell you why. At Sainsbury only get, I think, um, the dear minister was telling me, a, li a very limited number of produce is from Northern Ireland that goes into the supermarkets in Northern Ireland. And therefore, if they're increasing um, the uh, number of products from Northern Ireland in their supermarkets in Northern Ireland, I think that's a really good thing, actually, because it shows that our produce is uh, being able to take advantage of that. Uh, what I wouldn't like to see is that our consumers uh, have a, a reduction in the number of ranges that they're able to access, and I think we've seen a little of that happening, and it's something that we'll be engaging with the supermarkets on. Yes, well, I, I agree with you. I wasn't disagreeing with you, actually. I mean, it's a good thing that CMSPs are managing to access spar products, and wherever they access yeah. the stuff from, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, could I just ask you, I had a discussion earlier about the mother and baby homes. Um, I think both of you would probably remember that we had a debate about this in the House a few years ago, about the uh, Bon Secure home in uh, Chium. And it was Barry Michael Duff, Michelle's ex-colleague, who sponsored the debate. And a lot of the things that were being alleged at that time actually turned out to be quite true. In fact, in the, in the Republic, it turned out to be a lot worse than what was anticipated at that time. Now, I, I, I know that Youth Gillespie, and I've met her over this, is doing a, an excellent job, I'm sure she will. But it's, it, 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 there's, no, there's no border in this. I mean, this, this, these homes are organised by the same organisation, North and South, and they... The practices that have been revealed in the South are absolutely horrifying. There's no reason to think that it was any better up here. And some of these homes were still open in the early 2000s. At least two of them were. And it's hard to escape the notion that the only thing that would satisfy people will be the same as what happened in the South, will be a full public inquiry. And I acknowledge the work that Judith Gillespie is doing, but I think it probably needs to go further than that. I think you have to come at it, Trevor, just in terms of the approach. It's, I mean, Judith has done her piece of work, but she will make recommendations to us, and then that's where we decide in terms of what comes next. I just think at the heart of everything that we're doing, we have to have the victims and the survivors right at the centre of everything that we do. They should own the decisions that, that we take, and I think that that, to me, would be fundamental in terms of how we would respond to the report. I think that... Um, you know, it's, it has been long awaited. I think the fact that Judith will be presenting a report within the next, well, basically within the next two weeks, comes obviously very hot on the heels of the report um, in the south. And I think that, that so timing wise, I think that's a that's a good thing. But it, you, you said yourself, it is harrowing the things that happened, and the fact that it happened up until so recently um, is even even more harrowing because people think this is something that happened way back in the day. Well, clearly that's not the case. So. 
we have to respond um i think in in a way that's both that is, that is listening to the stories of the victims and the survivors and we have to respond in a way that is responsive to their needs and with sensitivity and with respect i think as well for for what they've been through and how far they've come so i don't want to jump the horse but i would certainly um say that w- whatever comes forward in terms of recommendations from from the group then we need to embrace it very quickly and we need to turn it around into what is the next step so that victims don't feel that they've reached a certain milestone and then you know things are parked again we need to turn this around very very quickly okay uh, one more very quick one Jerry, don't mind um it's, it's just around covid um and the closing of schools uh, particularly primary schools um as you well know the 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 children of key workers are still being accommodated in schools and they've been approached about a particular situation where there's quite a lot of very young children being dealt with in one of our prep schools. Uh, and they, the teachers are having to come in and so are the classroom assistants. But they're not, they, they have very little protection. Uh, is there a case for, in those circumstances, for people who are doing their job at risk in, those, in that sort of situation to be prioritised for vaccination? The uh, prioritisation in relation to vaccination is set by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, uh, and that's where we take our lead from. Uh, and the reason why it's set by them is they look at all of the different priorities and information that they have to decide where they can get the maximum impact on society. Uh, and that's why our care homes and our over 80s were the first, because um, when we had a meeting with Jonathan Van Tam, who is the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of England, he was able to share with us that if you vaccinate uh, 43 people in a care home, that's that saves a, a life, one life. But when you go down the priority list and you move into, say, for example, and I'm not saying all teachers are young teachers, but if you look at young teachers and if you vaccinated, I think he said um, a couple of thousands of young teachers it would take before you would save one life there. So they're looking at it from the point of view of saving lives in terms of uh, vaccination and how they can get the maximum uh, impact. And I thought it was interesting to hear ACC Alan Todd say today that he would rather uh, see uh, elderly uh, and uh, vulnerable people being vaccinated uh, than his police officers. And you might think that's strange coming from a police officer, uh, but I think he's recognising where the most vulnerable groups are, um, and particularly when you look at our death rates, where the most vulnerabilities are as well. Okay. I think just just I think just add, Trevor. I mean, I understand why there's a prioritisation, um, particularly as you're um, dealing with um, having to deal with the the vaccine as it comes in in different batches. However, I do think there's merit in, in arguing for public services to be those people who are in the front line um, being vaccinated first. So I think that uh, what we want to do and what we're trying to do with the, even with our own task force in the executive is to try to make sure that we pull out all the stops that allows us to be able to vaccinate people as quickly as possible. And we know there's so much goodwill out there. You know, you have pharmacists playing their part, you have the GPs playing their part, you have your community nurses playing their part. You also have um, massive community infrastructure, people who want to get on board. So we want a speedy rollout of the vaccination um, and we want to do everything we can, leave no stone unturned and, and supporting the health minister to get that rolled out as quickly as possible and reaching um, all those people on the, on the front line as well. I think the vaccination is one of the uh, good points in terms of Northern Ireland, so thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you I do need way. to move on. Um, and maybe just if it's if it if you felt it was relevant, um, Ministers, if one of you wanted to take an answer to the questions as we progress, like the ad hoc committee, but if, if the other feels that there's a, an element to it, then it just it might shave a bit of time from the responses. I'm going to go to Pat Sheehan next. If Pat was there to ask his question, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to ask a question around the, the COVID task force and, and focus on that, and particularly around its objectives, its strategy, and its priorities. Those countries that have been successful in combating the virus uh, all have used integrated, coordinated strategies uh, and a wide range of measures to tackle the virus. Now, it's my view, and I've been saying this all along, that the Department of Health doesn't appear to have an integrated, coordinated 
strategy and some of the advice that has been coming from the Department of Health has been questionable in, in, in my view. And the results of that can be seen now in the way our health service is under more pressure than it has ever been at any stage in this pandemic. And my fear now is that the Department of Health is going to put all its eggs in the one basket, and that basket being uh, the vaccine. And there are difficulties around that. First of all, it's not known how long protection will last for after people are vaccinated. And secondly, given the uh, high levels of transmission of the virus right around the world, uh, scientists are telling us that there is a chance that this virus will mutate to an extent where it becomes resistant to the vaccines, uh, uh, the vaccine over time. So there are serious questions they ask about a strategy as to how we can combat this virus. And I suppose, uh, you know, that would include things like contact tracing, mass testing and, and so on. And I suppose uh, to cut to the chase, the question I, I want to ask is, what's the task force going to do differently from what has already been done in the past? Thanks. Thank, thanks for that, um, Pat. I think that, so each department obviously has their own policy responsibility and health is responsibility in terms of um, the the testing programme, the contact tracing and all those things that need to happen. But it was very clear to ourselves that um, what we needed to see was an overarching umbrella structure that tries to bring together all the different um, threads. Because if, I mean, we're very clear in the view that what we needed to, to do is, is obviously deal with the here and now, but we need to look to the future. What does recovery look like? And certainly I would share the, the, the view of um, if you put all your eggs in the vaccination basket, even though the vaccination is, is our hope, as Trevor has just said, it is our, our light at the end of the tunnel, but there are different strains of the virus coming on. And thankfully, um, to date, those that none of those strains are resistant to the vaccinations that have been developed to, to date. But there's no doubt that that's going to, the, the virus will continue to mutate and there will have to be different vaccinations at different points. So we need to be, we can't wait to the summer, I suppose is our view, that we can't wait to the summer until such times as everybody's vaccinated that we can get back to some sort of semblance of normality. So what needs to be focused on in the here and now is the issue of tracking and tracing. It is the issue of mass testing, as we have um, suggested on many occasions, because we don't want to be in this um, endless lockdown scenario. We want to find a way to try to open things up till we get to the point where people are vaccinated. So, so therefore, without trying to cut across existing ministerial um, responsibilities and accountabilities, um, what we tried to do was to focus on um, on what we can do to try to bring all the different um, threads together. So there was um, the task force was established and it got a terms of reference very quickly. We're working with Strategic Investment Board. Um, they're going to help us in terms of what we can do around four key um, areas of work. Um, one is the area of strategic communications because clearly it's really, really important that we communicate to the public. But we also are doing a lot of detailed work around behavioural science, how to you know encourage people to comply. We're looking at, the, at um, obviously, the here and now. How can we support mass interventions and around, um, around the vaccine, mass testing, um, and all of that? We're looking at adherence, so working with the all those people who are responsible for um, coherence or compliance even with the with the regulations. So that's not, you know, we were at the PSNI Chief Constable yesterday. We've, we'll have be meeting with local government. We're meeting with all those who are tasked with um, trying to um, deal with compliance. And then finally, the, the issue that we're looking towards is the issue of recovery, economic recovery, societal recovery, health recovery. So this task force, we believe, will be the tool to, to bring all the different threads together and make sure that we um, that it's resisted at all times to put all the vaccine all the eggs in the vaccination basket and help us to to move forward. Okay, Pat. okay. Can I come back in there, just yes. chair? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I suppose thanks for that, Michelle. Uh, one one of the things you didn't mention there was travel restrictions. 
And when the chief scientific advisor was at the health committee last week, I asked him about the advice he had given to the executive prior to Christmas about uh, unrestricted travel from uh, England and particularly the south of England uh, into the north here. Uh, and he was of the view that that didn't pose a significant risk to public health here. Now, uh, I mean, it sounded counterintuitive to me that the health minister in England was saying the virus over there was out of control, that there was a new variant that was gaining dominance, and yet people there could walk into an airport unchecked, unrestricted, fly to here, get off the plane, uh, unchecked, unrestricted, and go about their business. Uh, and to say that there was that the risk was insignificant, uh, that that was the scientific advice. I mean, if that science, uh, it must have come straight from the, the Donald Trump school of science, uh, and some people would be forgiven for thinking that. But I suppose uh, the Dublin government has now imposed restrictions of a kind and that travellers coming in will have to have a negative test before they can get even, even on the plane at the point of departure. Uh, and is it, is it not the very minimum that's required here uh, in order to assure that there's maximum north-south cooperation and protection for the island of Ireland in general? Thanks. Yeah, in terms of travel, um, we have asked the questions that you have asked the questions around travel and, and the analysis from our scientific officer uh, is uh, that they, it isn't um, a, a big part of the spread of the virus. Uh, and so we take that uh, as to what he advises, because, of course, we're not uh, scientists and we're certainly not able to second guess what Ian and Michael advises us on. And I have to say they have been spot on in relation to the modelling um, that has been in front of us uh, on many occasions and, and again uh, over where we have been at Christmas and when they told us that we needed to put restrictions in place on the 26th of December. Um, we did that. Uh, I'm very glad that we did do that because we're now seeing the benefit of that, uh, Pat, because the numbers are starting now to go in the right direction in terms of the positive cases, and I think that that is very important. Uh, I know the health minister has, uh, on many occasions, reflected the fact that he has been frustrated with the amount of sharing of data uh, between Dublin Airport uh, and ourselves, and uh, there has been ongoing discussions in relation to that. I think the Attorney General in the Republic of Ireland has indicated that there isn't a difficulty from a legal perspective in sharing uh, data uh, from ROI airports um, to Northern Ireland, and uh, we would certainly like to see those locator forms and the information on those locator forms shared with us so that we can make an analysis in relation to people travelling through Dublin and then coming on up into Northern Ireland. Uh, but as I say, our scientific advice is that uh, travel within the common travel area, uh, which of course is the British Isles, is not contributing in any meaningful way to the spread of the virus. And if you look at the fact that R is starting to go down, uh, so from 1.8 where it was about 10 days ago it's about 1.1 1.2 at the moment and the fact that the new variant that uh, is present in the republic of ireland and in uh, southern england and indeed in scotland now uh, rises are by up to 0.7 uh, it is very much thought that uh, the new variant is certainly not dominant here in northern ireland it may be here in northern ireland but it's certainly not dominant in the way that it is in places like london at present just just to add, I know you don't want us to double up on every question, but just, just to add um, that we will be uh, meeting with the, or discussing on the phone with the Taoiseach later on this evening, the current COVID situation, and no doubt travel um, will be discussed there. I mean, it, my personal view is also that um, we should be approaching travel um, in an in a all-island approach, so we should be maximising that north-south cooperation and using the fact that we are an island to our advantage. Um, and I don't think that's been done sufficiently throughout the pandemic. However, um, I do think it's important that we have this conversation with the Taoiseach this evening and hopefully see if there's anything else that can be done in terms of, of travel or indeed any other areas of cooperation as we, because we're clearly in a, 
very difficult um, position across the island and the health services, the two health services on the island are under huge, huge pressure. And it's important that we share um, learning, share um, approaches and do whatever we can to maximise that cooperation. Thank you. And Joe, could I just respond very quickly? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and, and first of all, could I, 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 I concur with Arlene around the sharing of data? that there are problems with that and, and the responsibility rests with the government in Dublin and it's disgraceful that that issue of data sharing hasn't been resolved uh, at this point in time. Uh, in, in, in terms of the scientific advice, uh, and I accept that the executive acts on the scientific advice that's being given uh, to it, my, my problem is, is that there are many other scientists out there who are given different advice and we have the examples of international best practice around the issue of travel restrictions. Uh, and I think we need to look outside sometimes some of the advice that's coming from in the department. And even last week, uh, Deirdre Heenan and uh, Gabriel Scali, who are, are, are both you know, prominent in the field of public health, published a 10 point plan in terms of dealing with this pandemic, you know, which which I think should go into the executive for discussion. So uh, we, we shouldn't take a very narrow view on the scientific advice that's coming in. So there's no question there. Just uh, uh, thanks for coming in today and thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Pat. And I can say as well, Pat, there's nothing chills me more than the mere suggestion of a Donald Trump, Trump school of scientific research that would uh, definitely put, put years on you, the mere thought of it, and hopefully they, this day next week will be uh, all that Donald Trumpism will be behind us. Um, could I ask next then for Christopher Stalford, uh, his, a Trump his, supporter? I am not a Trump supporter, so you shouldn't malign my character in that way. Um, I was about to say his, uh, the Donald Trump scientific approach would be desperately affected if we ever run out of domestos in the shelves in the <laughs> supermarkets. But anyway, um, I mean, I... I, I do want to, I think, the context in terms of the, uh, the mother and baby uh, units um, is stark. The report that uh, emerged recently in 2017, the infant mortality rate in the United Kingdom is three, was 3.9 for every 1,000. It's now been established by this report that the infant mortality rate for children in those institutions was 150 per 1,000. I mean, that is a, that is a scandalous figure that would not exist anywhere else in the world. And I do agree with um, Trevor that it's likely that on this side of the border, the figures will ultimately prove similar. Could I ask uh, the First Minister or the Deputy First Minister, um, when will we be getting an update in the House just on the progress that's been made in investigating um, this brutal treatment of women and children. I was going to just say that I, as soon as the, um, well, just to concur with what you said, I think that we'll find that we are no different. Um, what happened to women in the 26 counties is, is also what happened to women here uh, in the north. So I think that uh, whenever we receive our detailed information around what actually happened, I think that we will um, will not be shocked I think is, is the way to put it, but I absolutely concur with you in terms of um, how abhorrent this was. These were women who were forced into homes, forced into labour, forced into giving their children up for adoption, forced into um, their children being stolen from them. Um, it is just, it's just beyond belief that, that this is something that uh, was a reality up until recent days. Um, I think that as soon as the executive receives the report, um, given the significance of the issue, then... I think there would have to be, uh, I'm sure Arlene would agree, that we'd have to have it, a, whether it's ourselves or health or whoever how that's done, there would have to be an executive uh, statement made to the Assembly just to give members a chance to um, have their have their views expressed and to ask questions on it. But I think what's important uh, for me certainly is that we turn it around very quickly and provide a next step very quickly for the victims and survivors. I, I, I agree with the Deputy First Minister in terms of all of these things need to be uh, victim-centred and going forward any processes uh, need to be shaped by the people who suffered. 
Um, from my perspective, I have absolutely no objection to the state issuing an apology to those people because the fact is that whilst these institutions were largely clerically run, it was the state in many cases that was handing people over uh, to them. So from my perspective, I think the state absolutely should apologise. Related to that then is the, the HIA and the rollout of um, the recommendations of uh, Sir Anthony Hart's report. Can I ask, in terms of payments that are being awarded, is there an established matrix for payments and in terms of just like a sliding scale so that people have an idea of what compensation they are entitled to? I don't think we have that as yet, Arlene. Yeah. Sliding scale. I think it's determined by the board, uh, Christopher, and I, I did in my remarks make reference to the fact that um, when um, Mr Justice Colton was in office, he, he did very quickly turn around those awards, and, and I think it was seven weeks from for the first one to come out, and mm. that was very much welcome, because I think we mm. all recognise that uh, victims of institutional abuse have faced undue delay uh, in getting justice and indeed uh, monetary compensation as well. Um, uh, Fiona Ryan is now in post and we look forward to working with her around the outstanding recommendations of the Hart report uh, in an effective way. But again, it comes back to it has to be something which is meaningful to the victims uh, of institutional abusers. I mean, Michelle and I could issue an apology today, but I mean, the reality is we need it to be the right apology and a, yes. and, and a meaningful apology and something that recognises what has uh, happened uh, to those people. And it will be the same for those people who were forced into Magdalene laundries and um, uh, into mother and baby homes. And, and let me say this, Christopher, you're right. The state has a responsibility in this. Um, the churches have responsibility uh, in this where they were church facilities. But when we look back, society as a whole has a responsibility because it was seen to be acceptable that if you were an unmarried mother and pregnant, that you went into one of those institutions and nobody batted a, an eyelid to that. So I, I actually think um, there's a whole piece of looking back at societal attitudes at that time as well, um, which we shouldn't shy away from either. Absolutely agree with that. Um, in terms of the um, HIA, the reason I, I raised the issue about a matrix is it has been highlighted to me that some people feel almost as though um, they're being bounced into accepting uh, the lowest sort of band of award. So a low, a low offer, a relatively low offer is being made to some people. And because they've waited so long and because they're so frustrated um, and because frankly, especially in the current climate, if people aren't working or aren't able to work, they're desperate and they will they will take it so that has been an issue that's been raised with me by some of the survivors and i'm just wondering how can we ensure that the process is protect against something like that from happening in the future going forward well i think christopher we will want to take that concern back yeah. to our officials and ask them direct questions around that now that you have raised it uh, as an issue i would have hoped uh, that anyone who was applying to the board would have had uh, independent legal advice uh, mm -hmm. in relation to all of this. Uh, but let us take your issue back and we'll certainly come back to you as soon as we can around all of that. Thank you. And just the one final question that I have. Uh, you will have seen um, First Minister and, and I'm sure Deputy First Minister as well. There has been um, talk on social media uh, and actually in the, in the, the mainstream media as well in relation to the invocation of Article 16 of the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, I do, um, I'm not going to pick a fight with the Chairman, but I do find it funny that people who have argued for this protocol for three years are now encouraging the government to do all, the, the executive to do all that we can to ameliorate the outcome of it. Um, I didn't argue for it, I argued for Brexit for the United Kingdom, but that's, we'll not go there. Um, could you talk to the processes of how exactly Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol would actually be invoked? What, what are the mechanics of how that would happen and does the executive have a role in that? 
Well, it's for the UK government to decide if they uh, invoke Article 16. And I thought it was interesting today to hear the Prime Minister say that he would not hesitate um, to implement uh, Article 16 if, there, if it was necessary. Um, I mean, I think the way in which the protocol has rolled out has shown that there is a necessity to, to looking at all of this again. There is a necessity to making sure that there is, and I'm quoting from the Article 16 protocol now, uh, societal, environmental or economic damage. Uh, to Northern Ireland uh, and therefore the conversations that we have on a daily basis will continue. We will look for solutions, of course, uh, but if Article 16 has to be invoked, it's uh, a matter for the UK government. Uh, there the, then uh, is uh, a role for the Joint Committee in that. Uh, and of course, uh, we uh, have, uh, a, as a result of New Decade, New Approach, uh, observer status on the Joint Committee, and I have to say it was very useful for us uh, during the latter part of uh, this year to be involved in that. Uh, but there is a, a, it's not a straightforward thing, uh, Christopher, as I'm sure you will recognise nothing involving the European Union ever is a straightforward issue, uh, but I think there definitely needs to be action taken by our own government in relation to this protocol, which is causing damage to the people of Northern Ireland. But just, just to be absolutely clear, because I think this is important, that it's put on the record, and it's in Hansard, the sole responsibility for the invocation of Article 16 does not rest with the Northern Ireland Executive, it rests in Downing Street. That's correct. Thank you. And I just think also, just to, to briefly add, um, I think that whenever you have a problem, it's really important that you diagnose it properly, uh, if you're certainly, if you're trying to find a solution. And what we have here is the fact that uh, Brexit was run right down to the wire. A deal was reached in the 11th hour there was a failure to, to prepare uh, on terms of the British side and checking in terms of supporting businesses in Britain who trade um, back and forth. So I think that um, the adjustment that um, businesses are having to make in the here and now is what's causing uh, a huge number of these difficulties. And as I have said earlier, um, we are working to try to um, get resolution to, that, that helps uh, minimise the disruption for Businesses, as, as in all these things, as we've, as we've always said in terms of Brexit, um, or as I've always said in terms of Brexit, um, the best you can do is mitigate the damage, and that's what we're trying to do right now. Um, this is why we've always said that Brexit was bad and it was always going to be the problems that come with it. Um, and that's going to go back to the point earlier today when someone talked about bloating, maybe the chair talked about bloating. It's not about that, it's about, um, it's about these are the realities of Brexit, these are the challenges which we have, and... Um, but for my part, I will work with the local business community to try to find resolution to the issues that are causing uh, concern right now. I, I, disagree, I disagree on Brexit, but I, I don't disagree. I don't think anyone could argue that the government's handling of the last 12 months has been an example of strategy and statecraft. OK, and, and of course, we'll, Christopher, we'll occasionally disagree, but we never Just fight. Just occasionally. We never fight. We never fight. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go back on to uh, Emma Sheeran now, please. Emma, if you're there. There we go. Yes. Hello, Emma. Sorry, it took me a wee minute to unmute there. That's fine. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can indeed. Yes, go on ahead with your question. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank uh, both the ministers for um, joining us this afternoon. I know we've ha had a lengthy discussion at this point. I don't intend on keeping anyone any longer than, than they need to be kept. But I just want to bring you back again to the, the conversation that had been had between yourselves and, and several of the members around the Mother and Baby Homes uh, report that was launched yesterday in the, in the 26 counties. And obviously it's very topical uh, because of that. And there's been a lot of discourse uh, in social media and in, in general media and uh, the general public, everyone is talking about it at the minute, and I suppose I don't think it could be underestimated just how widespread this this was and how recent it was, and there are probably incidences of it in almost every family in the, in the country, and and that's north and south, and it is just horrific and makes for harrowing reading, and the the, the litany of abuses and injustices that were served uh, on, on women and children. Uh, women mothers, many of them still children themselves, by the state and church organisations working hand in hand and, and complicit with each other and, and working in collaboration. And it, it, it's heartbreaking, when you, particularly when you, when you think about the fact that, that many of the women that had these, had their futures denied to them and decisions taken away from them, 
didn't even know where were didn't even know a lot of the time what was happening to them and had come out of a, a system where sex education was minimal and they probably didn't even understand what was happening to them for for a large portion of their pregnancy and it's it's just it's devastating and and, and can't be underestimated. So I, I want to, to thank you both for the assurance that you've given at the very start of this, that when we have a report in the North, that it's going to be victim led and the response from the state will focus on the victims and the responses from the victims and their accounts. Because I think what has been highlighted over the, the course of the past 24 hours and what has caused and compounded the hurt by the victims and the families of the victims is the fact that the language used throughout the report and the use of terms such as this account cannot be verified or this uh, this person's report of, of whether it be abuse or the, the domestic violence that happened in these homes can't be sort of backed up by any other evidentiary claims and that that is what has exacerbated the hurt that these people have went through. So just want to, to say that at the outset and thank you both for, for assuring us that when we when we have this release in, in the north it'll be handled differently thanks Emma and I think um, I think we both um, want to be very very clear that everything we do will be victim centered and everything we do will uh, in terms of what comes next I think the victims and survivors have to be part of the design of what comes next and, and we'll make sure that's that's the case I think you've set out yourself the experience of many far too many women um, going through the trauma which they have been through at a point in time to be re-traumatised by church and state by being denied information and access to birth records and, and just details of, of parents and, and everything else that, that came with it. I think the message that I would say to, to all those women, to all the victims and survivors is that we hear you and that we see you and that we will do everything we can and leave no stone unturned to uncover every bit of detail that we can and to give you what you need in terms of uh, what comes next. So we look forward to getting Judith Gillespie's report and, and we hope to be able to turn that around as quickly as possible and that we will be respectful and that we will um, listen to every woman and their experience uh, and, in terms of what has been their real lived experience and what has been a harrowing, harrowing uh, time. Thanks. I have one other question, Chair, if it's okay. And it's just around, I know that Monday, we seen the the first year anniversary of of our um, new decade, new approach, and the resumption of um, Stormont. And I just wanted to ask for yourselves. And I know it's been a difficult twenty twenty was a difficult year and provided us with challenges that we no one could have predicted. But what the 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 big wins in terms of the the aims from NDNA that, that have been achieved. And if we could get a bit of an update on particularly the language um, bills, I know that, that ACNA Gaelic at this stage is so, sort of the, the, the goal was to, to have action on that within three months. And obviously that was waylaid by COVID, but just where it's sitting at at the minute. Thank you. So I, mean, I don't think any of us um, thought that we were going to be faced with a global pandemic when all of those timelines were set in place. And certainly for us, we would have wanted to have seen more progress on a whole range uh, of issues. Um, and, you know, we do, of course, recognise that the cultural and language um, accommodation that was agreed in NDNA uh, has to be dealt with uh, in a meaningful way. And of course, we will want to deal with that this year. Uh, I think it's also uh, important to say that whilst uh, we haven't made the progress that we wanted to make, um, there has been some good things uh, put in place, not least uh, mental health strategy uh, put in place. We've been able to start committal reform in terms of dealing with the courts. So there have been and housing reclassification to allow more houses to be built um, so the private sector can build more houses. So there has been some good things that have moved along, um, not big headline issues that we would like to have seen moved along, but all the same, there has been um, uh, progress made. So. We will, uh, of course, turn our minds uh, to all of the rest of the issues in NDNA. We recognise that we have a, a short period left of this mandate. Uh, we will all be going out for uh, election uh, next May. Uh, so there's a lot to be done uh, in the short period that is left to us. And uh, we really want to get on with that. So uh, once uh, we're able to be in recovery position, we will be dealing with all of the issues that brought us back into this place. Uh, and I think that's important to say.
Just, just to say, I mean, a hugely difficult year uh, on many fronts, but not least because of COVID and, and because of Brexit. I think that um, even despite all the challenges, the fact that we are five parties in, in an executive, which is challenging uh, in itself, I think we have been able to make some achievements, and I think it's important to acknowledge those whenever they have been achieved, um, even you know, regardless of the fact that we've been dealing with the two major issues. But you know, there has been progress right across the whole range of departments. You know, the mental health champion, biggest shake-up in the housing programme, all the support we've been able to deliver for communities throughout the whole way through the pandemic. I think it's been really, really um, vital. So I, I'm certainly very glad that we have an executive um, that's able to respond to the pandemic. Do, we don't always get it right, and we certainly don't always agree, but we try our best, and I think the public try, the public want us to work together to try and respond in the best way we can. And but yes, there are things outstanding, many things outstanding, and uh, we want to see progress in those, and hope to do see so that that progress over the course of the coming weeks. Okay, thank you very much. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we can invite Martina Anderson for her questions. Martina, are you there? We'll get you up into the spotlight. There we go. Yeah, that's me unmuted. Um, thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you, Michelle, uh, for your presentation and for the questions. Given that the transition period wasn't used as it was supposed to, I think the clue was in the word, it was a transition period and um, to get businesses ready for what was going to happen at the uh, at the end of the, the Brexit period, being, being kicked out for some of us against our democratic will. But do you believe that there will be practical solutions to some of the reports that we have been hearing in relation to food shortage and what work is being done now to avoid any new challenges when the grace period runs its course in 10 weeks time? So I think, um, Martina, our companies here in Northern Ireland did do a lot of work to get ready. I, I think um, part of the difficulty was that the GB um, uh, businesses that were selling into Northern Ireland hadn't done as much work and they weren't as ready and that certainly seems to be uh, uh, everybody seems to be on common cause in relation to that and something um, that uh, we're trying to rectify through communications and making sure that they do know what is required um, so yes I, I take your point on that uh, but I think it's more of a case against GB companies as it is against uh, Northern Ireland companies I think that they have known for some time that there's going to have to be uh, a, a uh, regardless of what happened, uh, that they were going to have to take action. So, as Michelle has said, uh, we do have daily meetings, uh, either ourselves or our junior ministers uh, are on what's called an XO meeting um, to try and deal with some of these issues that have arisen. Um, uh, as we've said, we've been putting pressure on around the VAT and secondhand cars, so we're pleased to see that there's a solution coming in relation to that. So, we're trying to take these issues by issues and, and look for a solution. Uh, one of the biggest issues is on groupage, and you will know uh, that in haulage, when they collect different loads in different places, uh, that that is causing problems, and therefore we need to see a solution there. And it's one of the things that we'll be talking about when we're with um, Michael Gove later on uh, this afternoon. Uh, so we're we're absolutely committed to trying to find solutions to all of these difficulties, uh, and that's where our focus is at. Um, can, can I can I ask about the um, peace funding? Uh, I just want some assurance that the, it's much valued peace funding across the board. It's going to be matched and continued going forward. And related to that, given that we've heard a lot about the shared prosperity fund, I'm a bit concerned that there's discussions, sort of reports anyway, of, of discussions going on in relation to the budget paper and some funding being looked for from the EU that's going to be lost here to the north out of other ministers' budgets. Uh, given that the British government had told us that we would be going to get the funding replaced on the Shared Prosperity mm -hmm. Fund. So where is that at? So on the Peace Plus uh, programme, there's a really good story to tell there because actually uh, the initial programme has been increased um, and UK government recently announced that there would be additional funding of over 200 million. Um, so that brings the total programme value to approximately £1 billion. Um, you will recall uh, the Irish government ourselves, uh, UK government put in the funding um, and we had a discussion uh, around some of the high level thematic um, 
SEUPB uh, proposals, uh, which came to the executive uh, just on, on Tuesday past, uh, and we'll be engaging more with the chief executive about those thematic uh, ways forward. So I think the Peace Plus uh, story is a good one, Martina. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, we still have clarity in relation to that. Um, we need to uh, know about its competitive nature because if it is a competitive fund, it's more challenging for us in Northern Ireland, as I think you understand. Uh, so therefore, we need to get the clarity in relation to that. And I know the Minister for the Economy uh, is pushing hard to get clarity on that uh, in the coming weeks. Okay. Can I, can I um, make an appeal to you in relation to tomorrow's executive? We were told at the Infrastructure Committee today that there would be a discussion uh, coming to you tomorrow, and I don't know about the reality of this, but this is what the officials told us in relation to the taxi drivers and the taxi operators with regards to a second scheme. And it's just, it's not that you would need reminded, uh, but both of you, both Arlene and Michelle, you made a statement on the 24th of November, and Arlene, quite clearly, you had sent a signal to the operators, taxi operators, private bus operators, and coast operators that would face, you said, a significant reduction in demand in their service, and Michelle, you said the same for taxi, private bus and coach operators too, in relation to the negative impact. However, when the scheme was defined, the bus operators were left out of the scheme. And then there are some taxi drivers who temporarily suspended their insurance. And because of the way the scheme was defined, they were left out of the scheme. Now, some of them are shielding and some of them, um, their, their own um, companies that they were dealing with, insurance companies, advised them just to take a temporary. So they have ended up that they are now being excluded. They're now being told they might, in a pro rata basis, they will lose some funding if they have, for instance, you know, temporarily suspended the insurance for a month or two. So I would ask you, because it looked like in the spirit of the statement that you just put out on the 24th of November, when you told the taxi operators that they would get the scheme and also that the taxi drivers on block, and it seems to be there's been a lot of bureaucracy around it, it has ended up excluding some taxi drivers and the bus operators. And I would ask you if you would take a look at that please tomorrow, if it is tomorrow or whenever you are going to be dealing with that matter. Yes, so it's taken some time for this game to come about. So we certainly can raise the points that you've raised with the infrastructure minister um, tomorrow with the executive if she's intending to bring the detail of this game. So more than happy to, to raise that on behalf of the taxi drivers. Can I ask just one final question and it's in relation to an arrangement to be put between COVID patients between Inniskillen Hospital and Cavan. Uh, general, for instance, you know, if beds occupancy uh, exists in one or other of the hospitals, do you know if there's some arrangement being made? Like we've heard about a memorandum of understanding, and Arlene, you've talked about it, and Michelle in in the chamber at times. But will it sort of deal with issues like that? I, I have to say, uh, Martina, I was speaking to. Um, Anne Kilgallen, our mutual chief executive, um, and she didn't mention that. But uh, I mean, obviously, uh, and Michelle said this yesterday, if there is a request for assistance, of course, mm -hmm. that should be looked at. And it um, doesn't matter whether it's coming from us to the Republic or the Republic to us. Uh, I mean, we should at all times try to assist, uh, particularly in such circumstances where they're uh, under incredible pressure. That's the case. Thank you. Thank you both for Thanks. that. Thank, thanks, Michelle. Thank you. OK, uh, members, thank you very much indeed uh, for all of those questions. And to the First and Deputy First Minister for giving us nearly uh, two hours. Um, I suppose the key message for all of us is the issue of safety uh, in terms of uh, COVID. We all need to continue to do uh, what we can to try and minimise uh, our movements and to ensure that we follow all of the guidelines and the regulations that are there. I, I welcome maybe the leadership from our committee today where we only have two members present who are very local uh, to Parliament buildings uh, and as all MLAs know unfortunately standing orders don't permit uh, chairs to, to do so virtually, it has to be done in presence in the room so uh, that requires me to be here. Uh, to enable the committee meeting to happen. So I, I want to, to thank the, the, say the, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister for their uh, attendance. I don't know um, if it is by default design or 
accident or the fact that you aren't in the same room. But I do have to say that I feel that your approach today uh, was very harmonious and determined to try and address all of the issues. I think it's fair to say in 2020 uh, that the public were rightly a little bit sick of all the fighting and the bickering. And I think they, they like politicians and they like the executive best whenever it is working together, uh, that it is working and pulling in the same direction to tackle the issues that impact people's lives day and daily. Uh, and at this time, that most important issue is uh, getting ourselves past uh, this virus. So I want to thank you both for your attendance today, to wish you a happy new year uh, and to look forward to further uh, contact with you through the committee as the year progresses. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, committee, I'm going to suggest just a two-minute break, uh, just for us to catch our breath and to get ourselves ready for the next presentation. So we'll take a two-minute break, please. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. They had a wee jig around. Okay, members, we'll make a start back again. Thank you very much. After that short recess, we're going to move on now to item five, uh, Brexit assessment of the impact uh, of Brexit on the institutions and Northwest North, South and East, West relationships. We have departmental officials present to um, update us. If I could refer members to pages 44 to 200 of the meeting pack for the relevant papers. Um, and just to update you that unfortunately, Andrew McCormick has had, he's actually joining the uh, First and Deputy First Minister, I think, at, his next, at their next engagement because we've ran over a little. Um, but we have uh, both uh, Tim Losty, the Joint Secretary of the North South Ministerial Council, and Lorraine Linus as the EU Future Relations from the Executive Office. I think if I could just confirm uh, that that is Lorraine that's on with us on the phone number there on the audience list. Uh, Lorraine, is that you there? Yes, Chair, sorry, I've had difficulty joining my again. Can you hear me okay? Not a problem, we can hear you now, that's grand. Well, look, we'll pass over to, to, to Tim and to Lorraine if you maybe want to, to give us a few words of an update, and then what we can do is we can move on then and ask a few questions after that. Thanks, Chair, and, and apologies just for Andrew not being able to join today um, to lead on the briefing. So, uh, if you forgive us just for, for filling in where um, Andrew might have added a little bit more uh, light and shade to. to okay, um, Lorraine seems to have dropped down into the audience again. If we could get her moved up into the spotlight. That's you back again, Lorraine. Can you hear us okay? Yes, yes, Sorry. that's fine. So um, I wasn't sure how much you had heard at that stage, but just to say uh, Andrew's apologies for not being able to, to join today. Um, and just um, to forgive us a bit if we're just sort of filling in for Andrew, and, and who might have been able to add a little bit more light and shade to the discussion. Um, so first off, just to say, um, in relation to this being a, a verbal update rather than a paper, uh, it's fair to say that there hasn't been a lot of substantive work done uh, in relation to this area, mostly because we were uh, not clear on the outcome of both the implementation of the protocol and the decisions that were made uh, by the Joint Committee on the 17th of December have been helpful in that regard. And secondly, on the outcome of the future negotiations with the EU. And as you're aware, that agreement was reached with the EU on the 24th of <laughs> December. So maybe if I just sort of start at the very highest level of the um, East-West relationships and perhaps start with the Intergovernmental Review, or IGR. Um, on the 14th of March 2018, the Joint Ministerial Committee agreed that officials would review uh, on the existing intergovernmental structures including the Memorandum of Understanding to ensure that they were fit for purpose. Uh, this was really brought forward because of the UK's impending exit from the EU. Uh, since that time, officials from TO have been participating at official level in the discussions on the review uh, and, and on the basis that any agreement would need to be referred to the executive for final endorsement. Now, in the absence of plenary meetings of JMC, um, these discussions have, to some extent, been included in the agenda of JMCEN. Um, but there has been a growing consensus that the admin among the administrations that these issues should be discussed at IGR ministerial quadrilateral meetings um, in the absence of discussion of a future meeting of JMC plenary. 
or its replacement forum. So the latest quadrilateral meeting of ministers took place on the 10th of September, at which it was, uh, it was agreed that good progress has been made, but ministers tasked the project board to bring forward all proposals together into one paper and produce a second paper uh, with a little bit more detail on the critical path for delivery. And a draft of this paper is currently being finalised. And it's intended that these papers will be completed in time for the next ministerial quadrilateral meeting in the coming weeks, which will be hosted by the uh, Scottish Government. However, our ministers have had the opportunity to discuss issues at some of the JMCEN meetings, most uh, lately on the 3rd of December. In relation to the British Irish Council, uh, Brexit has been discussed at previous big summits under the agenda item of political developments. Um, and BIC is not a negotiating or decision-making forum, so discussion there has principally consisted of member government, each member government com uh, commenting on the implications of particular aspects of Brexit for itself. Um, and the, the Council has agreed that the next BIC summit will be hosted by the Northern Ireland Executive in June 2021 and will reflect the priority issues for the members at that time. At this stage, I just want to bring in Tim to, uh, to do a, a, a verbal update on the North-South Ministerial Council elements, and then I'll come back in again on some other aspects of Brexit after that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Chair. Can you see and hear me okay? We can indeed, Tim. Yes, good to see you. Yeah. Thank you. Good to see you all. Um, so uh, we do believe that in the North-South Ministerial Council, we have a structure which brings together the decision makers in each of our jurisdictions in some of the key areas of mutual benefit. So it does make sense we fail to utilise this form to address a number of the challenges that may arise due to Brexit. Um, shortly after the referendum in July 2016, the NSMC agreed to work together to ensure that Northern Ireland's interests are protected and advanced and the benefits of North-South cooperation are fully recognised in any new arrangements which emerge as regards the future relationship with the European Union. And then following the restoration of the executive, uh, there was a plenary meeting held in July 2020. And at that meeting, the Council again discussed the implications of Brexit and recognised the common interests of both jurisdictions to minimise disruption to trade and economic activity and the, the role that we could play in this. So between um, October and December of 2020, NSMC held 12 sector meetings and uh, the impact of Brexit was included as an agenda item in all of those meetings. The Council has also established a group of senior officials from the Executive Office the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Department of the T-Ship to consider Brexit issues uh, in, in the future. Um, a specific role has also been conferred on the NSNC in terms of referring proposals to the Specialised Committee, which has been established on issues related to the implementation of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. And the Council has been asked, uh, the Council has asked officials to develop a mechanism for the agreement of ministers for referring proposals to that specialised committee. Um, we've also held meetings between the North-South bodies and their sponsor departments to determine the impact of, uh, of Brexit and their operations currently and in the future. And there is a great deal of cooperation that goes on with the bodies and with their sponsoring departments to identify and address any issues. Uh, and there is, I can confirm, a lot of cooperation and commitment to cooperation going on across the board with the NSMT bodies. So I'm not sure, Lorraine, if you want to finish on anything from your side. Yeah, yes, Tim, if I could just sort of add um, our experiences, in uh, particularly in our relationships with uh, North-South, and a key challenge that we've had uh, over the last uh, while has been the need for both the executive and the Irish government to respect the negotiating positions of both the EU and the UK. And that has, that did, has uh, resulted in an arm's length relationship between both sides while the negotiations were ongoing. 
And with the conclusion of the negotiations and agreement, it is hoped then that the relationship north and south um, can improve. And in fact, we've already seen uh, a better opening of relationships uh, since the agreement on the 24th of December. I just wanted to add one, a couple of other things just in relation to the Brexit subcommittee um, as one of the structures. It's in line with the commitment in the New Decade New Approach Agreement. Uh, it was, you know, it established a Brexit subcommittee. Um, that Brexit subcommittee was subsequently replaced by the Executive Committee dealing with EU exit matters during 2020. And the role of that committee will then need to be considered uh, further as we understand the implications of the future relationship that has been agreed between the UK and the EU. And then just one final point, uh, which would be on the legislation, which would be on of, of interest to the uh, committee as well. Uh, the legislative work programme that had gone on uh, prior to the end of the transition period was prioritised. Um, there was the deprioritised legislation. Uh, some of that was um, uh, put towards the end of the after the transition period, and we'll be working with departments over the coming weeks. Uh, to work out the tail of that legislation and the implications that will have for the uh, assembly committees as well. So um, that's a very quick overview of the main um, structures and where we are on each of them. And uh, Tim and I would be happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. OK, thank you very much. And given the, the lateness of this session, I'm sure all members will curtail questions and, and we'll keep them as, as brief as possible. The, the two connected issues that I wanted to raise myself was just that given, I mean, you made reference there that during the process that there was some difficulties with both North and South being on, on different sides in the negotiations and that, that would have had an impact. But I'm thinking really of the groups that are on the ground that maybe are working with each other and that have, uh, North and South particularly in border areas. But if they're encountering problems now as a result um, of Brexit and the completion of the transition programme, there, there's no joint a uh, consultative working group established as far as I know yet, um, which would be a forum for their concerns to have them addressed by the specialised committee. Likewise, um, the North and South Ministerial Council is an opportunity to put forward issues as well, but given that that requires agreement North and South and agreement within the Executive in the North, which may not be the easiest to achieve, I'm concerned that the voices of groups on the ground may not make it through uh, to the committees that are able to impact change in the issues and the concerns that they have. But what advice do you have for groups that find themselves in that, permit, in that situation? And do you have any indication of when the Joint Consultative Working Group will be populated and, and start meeting to give a voice for the sectors? Yeah. Sure, maybe if I could uh, try and answer the question in relation to working with the groups. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, we had 12 sector meetings, which in uh, covered a lot of the areas of uh, North South responsibility and also met with the, the uh, NSMT bodies. And um, what we've been doing is getting information via the departments and via the organisations as to what was happening with the stakeholders and the groups that they were interacting with. So we were getting information from them and fitting it into those sector meetings and where there was the potential to resolve a lot of the issues there at that sector meeting, the, the, the departments would make that decision. Um, I would say from observing those meetings that um, they were very positive, ministers and departments engaged very positively in uh, addressing a lot of these issues. So there is an avenue there for groups to raise any issues and concerns um, through the North South Ministerial Council Secretariat, uh, we would also meet from time to time with the various council groupings, the Chambers of Commerce and community organisations. So uh, we also see ourselves as having an ability to listen to what's happening at a grassroots level. And uh, we will raise those with the relevant department or organisation and see if they can take those issues forward. So that there, are, there are a number of sounding boards for a lot of those groups on the ground to bring their issues um, to, to the NSMC and to the departments and ministers. And there's also a number of 
organizations, including the, um, the Institute for Cross-Border Studies, as well as uh, universities and other think tanks uh, to meet with us and also to make us aware of issues. So, as I say, it may not be 100% perfect, but it is certainly an attempt to try and get a lot of that information from groups and then signpost it to the relevant organisations. It sounds very informal. We'll find out what the issues are, pass it to the department, and hopefully they'll address it. But it's that ability to get something on the agenda of the specialised committee and eventually to, um, to the joint committee, which requires the formalised structures. And are, the, are those formalised structures not available at the minute? Or is it just a case of that you hope just to sort them out informally? We, we would try to address a lot of those issues by signposting them to the relevant departments, but we're also establishing uh, uh, the Brexit group of senior officials who will also be able to consider any issues that don't have a home, as it were. And then through that grouping, there would be, uh, we, we will be looking at how we can formally then raise them back through, through um, our government systems here and then on to any of the um, uh, committees that have been established to look at these issues. So, um, as Ryan was saying, we we weren't able to um, fully establish that group prior to the agreement on the 24th of December. We've had a number of discussions with colleagues in DFA and the T6 office. Uh, I've actually had a meeting with them there this morning. And we are looking at the membership and the sort of issues that that group will be taking forward in the future. And then we will see that group is having a very, uh, very strong role in dealing with any of the consequences of Brexit. Okay. Chair, if, if, Chair, could I maybe just come in on your other point on the joint consultative working group that sits under the specialised committee? Um, just to say that you know the, we understand that this is still under consideration by the UK and the EU, and expect that there will be more substantive discussions on on how this will operate later this month. I mean, the rules of procedure have been published, but um, not you know the, how this group will operate. I mean, under the rules of procedure, the UK and the EU will have official delegations and may invite experts if both sides agree. So there, there's still a lot of of work to be done on how the JWC um, will operate. And it's it's an issue that within TO that we're raising on a regular basis with UKG, because it's very important in relation to uh, the, the management of the protocol and in particular the legislation that sits under Annex 2 of the protocol. Okay, th thank you very much for those responses. I'm gonna pass now to Martina Anderson, who I has got her hand up for a question there. If we can get Martina up into the spotlight, then we can get the questions. Uh, you're muted there, Martina. I don't know if it's yourself that's muted or if it's mu muted at our end. If... There you are. There you I'm go. I'm muted now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Tim, good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, can I ask, in relation to the Specialist Committee, uh, on the matter of service, the service industry. I think that's going to be hit very hard. It doesn't appear in the protocol. And some in the industry feel that they've been left sort of high and dry in relation to the uh, withdrawal agreement and the arrangement. So is, is there an opportunity to have something like that dealt with by the specialist committee who can filter that through to the joint working group or the joint committee, however that is going to proceed. Because we need to find a home uh, for this industry to be given some attention. Obviously, at the moment, people are looking at trade and all that's happening in terms of um, the end of the transition and how that wasn't really prepared for too well. So where, where can we locate that? And as a committee, how can we monitor how that's been taken forward? Sorry, can I just clarify again, Martina, because I, I lost a bit of connection there. Is this in relation to services? Services, yes. 
Yeah. Um, well, services um, aren't part and parcel of the um, the protocol. Um, there's obviously a read across in terms because the protocol covers uh, goods and not services. So one of the things we'll be looking to is what has been agreed within the trade and cooperation agreement. Uh, uh, there's a range of agreements within there. Obviously, there, there, there's financial services, but there's also a, a, a chapter on ordinary services within there as well. Now, there's a range of governance structures that will be set up to oversee the trade and cooperation agreement. And we're currently looking at those. I mean, it's a complex agreement, and, and you'll appreciate that staff at the minute are very, very focused on the operational delivery issues since the end of the transition period. But um, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have already expressed the JMCEN their desire to be represented on the governance structures covering the trade and cooperation agreement as well, given the benefit that they had felt from their participation in the Joint Committee and the Specialised Committee. And I'm certain that that will be the position of Scotland and Wales in this as well. So there's a lot of work to do, first of all, in understanding what the impact of the services agreement is, and then secondly, how we can be involved on the various levels of governance within that, which is quite substantial within the agreement. Uh, and it's going to take a bit of time to work through that. Can I ask if the mutual recognition of qualifications is going to be dealt with as part of that? MRPQ is, is one of those areas where um, obviously the, the, the TCA wasn't as, as, as good as it could have been in that area. What is agreed is what is, it, is in the Canada deal. So it's a, a pathway, more or less, or a framework to MRPQ. So for specific issues such as MRPQ, we will be needing to look at what does the TCA provide? What does the, and I skipped all the letters, what does the future relationship provide? What does the common travel area um, uh, provide? Where do we need additional uh, bilateral engagement with, with Ireland? Where will there be per, perhaps from profession to profession? So there is, there is elements in there now that we have all of these agreements, including the common travel area, so that we need to look at where the gaps are and then look through which mechanism we seek to address those. I can foresee difficulties because the common travel area is not in legislation, it's built in sand. There's going to be difficulties unless we give that some legislative standing. And it's just something, Chair, I think the mutual recognition of professional qualifications is something we need to keep an eye on. Uh, you know, when we talk in language of um, RPQ and that people wouldn't maybe understand as much, perhaps, what we're talking about, but we need to try and make sure that people understand that we are scrutinising this matter for them. Can I ask in relation to, I asked the, the, the two ministers when they were in front of us, they obviously had a lot of questions. But can I ask again about the grace period? We've only 10 weeks of this grace period and we know there could be challenges if work isn't done in the interim. So um, what work's going to be done over the next 10 weeks as we head to the end of this grace period, given that the Assembly unfortunately didn't agree to the extension of a transition? We probably wouldn't have got it anyway because the British government wouldn't have argued for it. But that said, we have a transition now uh, for 10 weeks. And um, it's, I'm concerned about what's going to happen at the end of that. Uh, yeah, I'll say a little bit uh, about the grace period. Yes, there are a number of grace periods within what was agreed uh, within the protocol. Um, and obviously, those present further challenges this year. So as I think the First Minister and Deputy First Minister said, we'll be working very closely with both the businesses and the industry. And also with the with the government to make sure uh, you know we recognise that those are potential uh, other readiness issues that are coming further down the line. Um, so those are all on our radar in terms of issues that need to be addressed. And um, the regular meetings like today that you know they, they are already on the radar. And, and you will have seen from the questions even in uh, the, the House of Parliament today. Uh, they're on the mind of, of FM and DFM and of businesses here and also of the government. So they're already being raised uh, regularly in terms of how those are going to be addressed. And Chair, I think it's something we have to keep on our agenda because it's only 10 weeks and the clock's going to start ticking. So let's not run to the end of that and have another kind of reaction uh, like we are, had maybe over the last few days around a trade and adjustment shock and that. 
Uh, so we need to be seen uh, to be putting in the work and actually doing that. Can I ask Tim in relation to the North South Ministerial Council, particularly in relation to the common framework? Tim, one thing that, that I notice in sometimes when the officials present in front of us and when they're talking about the common framework, they don't deal with the third principle which is going to ensure the recognition of social and economic linkages between the North and South and adhere to the Good Friday Agreement, and particularly in the respect of the devolution settlement, as it's called as well, because when you go through the framework and you start to realise that in the agreement that the British government can freeze the competency of the Assembly in terms of policy areas that are subject to uh, what they might say the common framework. So. Where, what kind of discussions has taken place in the NSMC with regards to the common framework and the implications of that common framework? Because it can't just be a common framework for Britain and here. It's a common framework across this island, particularly in the context of the North-South Ministerial Council. Um, well, since I've been involved with the, uh, with the NSMC from September, our primary focus has been on getting the sector meetings, plenary and institutional meetings up and running again. Uh, and that was the first priority and under that it included both Brexit and COVID issues. Um, we're now at a situation where we, we have more information in relation to what's happening with Brexit. So as we move forward with both the senior officials group and other issues uh, that need to be discussed uh, uh, with both the Irish Government Department of Foreign Affairs, Taoiseach's office and that, and then also looking at the British Irish dimension. We will start to focus a lot more on those issues uh, and we will be taking the lead from ministers on those. Can I ask him, institutionalised meeting, what, is there a date set for an institutional meeting? The, In, uh, the, the institution uh -huh. meeting, sorry. Uh, uh -huh. The, we had an institutional meeting on the 16th of December and the Deputy First Minister will be making a statement on that at the Assembly next week. We also had a, a plenary meeting, an SNC plenary meeting on the 18th of December and Deputy First Minister will also make a statement in relation to the outcome of that meeting. Okay, Chair, given the time it is and everything else, I appreciate what we've got so far, but there's a couple of matters I think, Chair, we need to just keep in our agenda. Um, as we're moving forward, particularly in the next 10 weeks, but also the issue of services and then the common framework, a third principle. That those are three that I would be keen to uh, have some focus and attention on as we go forward. Okay, thank you very much, Martina. Um, I don't have any other indications for questions. I'll just maybe give an opportunity if there's anybody online that wants to indicate by putting their hand up on the using the hand up mechanism. <laughs> Sound right. But <laughs> okay, so look, what we'll do at this stage for this segment is to, to thank Tim and to thank Lorraine for their input. Um, it's an issue that's obviously going to grow as the year goes by, uh, and I've no doubt that we'll have you back again at some point for, for future updates. But thank you for coming today with this update. That's been appreciated. Um, and I know, Lorraine, you're, you're hanging on for the next uh, session with us, so if you're happy enough, I'll just do the... The, the bits in advance of bringing you in. Um, so, folks, we'll move next to item six, which is the Brexit update on common frameworks. This is an oral evidence session with the departmental officials. On page 202 of the meeting pack and page six of the table pack are the relevant papers. Uh, in the table pack, the response from the executive office to the committee's letter of the 16th of December, highlighting concern in relation to the scrutiny of common frameworks by the assembly. Now, if you're happy, we would like to copy this response to the relevant Assembly committees, uh, asking them to notify the Executive Office Committee if there's any future issues going forward. Would members be in agreement to that? Yes, that's fine. Okay, probably somewhat easier to get consent, given that none of the other members can talk. <laughs> but I am sure that if any of them do have an issue, that they can, they can let us know uh, whenever, uh, at some point after. Um, if I could then refer members to page 17 of the table pack for a response from the Executive Office to the Committee's letter of the 19th of November, asking if the First Minister and Deputy First Minister will give evidence uh, to the House of Lords Common Framework Scrutiny Committee. Uh, can I get agreement that this letter be forwarded to the House of Lords Common Framework Scrutiny Committee for information? 
I shall take the two members present in the room as a straw poll of all others. But again, if there's any specific issues with that with other members, uh, they, they can certainly raise it when they're uh, back online again. Um, the departmental briefing paper, page three of the table pack, was received at 9.44 a.m. this morning. Uh, apologies for the late uh, forwarding of that to members, but we only received it today. Um, which is interesting, given that later on we do have a response uh, in our written correspondence from the First and Deputy First Minister telling us that they will endeavour to ensure that all papers are supplied to us uh, in a timely manner. So I'll let you deal with that piece of fiction later on whenever we, we raise it, uh, as we've got the, our third item of our agenda today and we have breached the rule again. Anyway, for by that, I will take the opportunity to welcome uh, back again Lorraine Linus, uh, the EU Future Relations uh, Department from the Executive Office. And I am hoping that we have Stephen Hamilton uh, from the same division and Michael Williamson also from the same division. If I can just advise all of you that the session is being recorded uh, uh, by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the committee webpage. Uh, members, if you're all on board with this, there is Lorraine, is it yourself taking the lead in this? Yes, it is. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, we can indeed. So I'll pass over okay. to yourself then. Okay, thank you, Chair, for the introductions and the opportunity to provide the committee with an update on common frameworks today. Um, the committee was last updated on the 7th of October, and as you've mentioned, a short briefing paper is provided on the progress that's been made. Uh, since our last briefing and I just want to take the opportunity to apologise that the paper has only been received by the committee just prior to the meeting. And considering the progress on the development of the individual common frameworks, it's also important to recognise the major events that have occurred in the last few weeks that will have a significant impact on the development of common frameworks in the coming year. In the coming year. And these include, as I mentioned in the previous presentation, the key decisions on the implementation of the protocol, which were agreed by the Withdrawal Agreement Joint Committee on the 17th of December. On the same day, the Internal Market Act was given royal assent, and the UK and EU reached agreement on its future relationship on the 24th, and that passed into law on the 30th of December. And then, of course, since then, we've had the end of the transition period on the 31st of December. In addition to the briefing provided, the ninth EU Withdrawal Act and Common Framework Statutory Report has been published by the Government on the 10th of December. And this is a good source of information and sets out the UK position on the development and implementation of the Common Frameworks between June and September of last year. In terms of progress since the last briefing, the main activity was the completion of Stage 3 of the Priority Frameworks. As set out in the paper, the review and assessment process was completed mid-November for 35 outlined frameworks. This process assessed a range of criteria for each framework, including governance, impact on the internal market, dependency on the outcome of the future relationship negotiations, and stakeholder engagement. It also considered the specific circumstances for Northern Ireland, in particular adherence to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, the economic and social linkages between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and whether there was an impact on areas identified for North-South cooperation and implementation through NSMC, and how they would operate with the protocol. Following the completion of the review and assessment process, the common frameworks were approved by the respective de departmental ministers and have been submitted for provisional confirmation uh, by JMCEN. Three frameworks did not complete the process, and the details of these are set out in the briefing paper provided. Throughout the Common Frameworks development process, it's been recognised that the cross-cutting issues of the protocol, the terms of the EU-UK's future relationship with the EU, the internal market, and to a degree the outcome of the Intergovernmental Relations Review, would affect the final form of the majority of the frameworks. However, development could not be delayed until these issues were resolved, and consideration now needs to be given to the next steps in the process. Given the major developments, a stock take of the Common Frameworks programme is currently being carried out, which will inform these next stages. But for following provisional confirmation by JMCEN, the procedure that had previously been agreed 
is that each common framework will be submitted to the relevant assembly committee for scrutiny prior to implementation. Arrangements are also under consideration for the management of this process given the Scottish and Welsh elections which will have an impact on the scrutiny timetable. In conclusion, I'd just really like to emphasise our role within EU Future Relations Division in the Common Frameworks Programme is that of a central governance and oversight function across the four administrations and across NICS departments, with the responsibility for developing the individual common frameworks remains within the relevant departmental policy teams and ministerial portfolios. As the committee is aware, the profile of the common frameworks has increased during the passage of the Internal Market Bill and the establishment of a House of Lords Scrutiny Committee, and common frameworks remain an important area and in conjunction with the Internal Market Act will define the relationship between the four areas within the UK and in managing policy divergence as we move forward. So Stephen, Michael and I would be happy to take any questions that you might have on the briefing paper or the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that presentation and the second go for yourself today, uh, Lorraine. Um, I suppose, really, I, I was just maybe to tease out, you know, there, there was a lot of, maybe not quite confusion, but certainly there wasn't a full understanding pre-Christmas, what the, or pre the 31st of December, what was actually required by the Common Frameworks process. And there was certainly a lack of clarity around the Assembly in terms of who would have to deal with which elements of it. And I suppose in that sphere where we were before the breakup for Christmas, the, the deal kind of has come after that. So with that deal in place, do you feel that that changes the timeline uh, for the common frameworks and their implementation and whether or not there is a, a change to the processes that would have to be followed here in the Assembly as a result? Well, at present, there's no change to the timeline. Um, the timeline is still that once the uh, common frameworks receive their JMCE and provisional co um, uh, confirmation, they will then move to the scrutiny stage. Um, but as I alluded to, I think... Um, we are making some, uh, having some discussions within the, uh, the the structure, the governance structure, about whether that needs to be looked at at this particular stage. And so I can't say for sure that that would be the process that that, that is the defined process at present. But it is certainly something that we need to look at, um, because the purpose of getting this, the, the frameworks through to this stage three by the end of the of the year, the end transition was certainly with one eye to the possibility of there being no, no deal in place. Um, there is a deal in place now. Uh, there's a lot of information there. So uh, it's something that we may have to provide to you at a future uh, point or write to you and say what the next process is going to be because there's been no firm decision to change the route that we're on. But it is something I think that we seriously need to think about. Okay, we also, we would receive as the Executive Office Committee that scrutinises the, the Executive Office, which is kind of charged with this process, albeit that there are other committees that actually deliver um, the scrutiny for the individual common frameworks. But there were a number of key delays in that process of scrutiny for the, the, the handful of common frameworks that were dealt with pre uh, the 31st of December. Has there been any work undertaken by the department to try and work out what it was that was causing that delay, uh, why there wasn't the timely sharing of, of the information uh, from, from London through to the, department, or the, the departmental committees here? Uh, and has that been prepared for and, and maybe tightened up going forward? I think it is a key issue, and certainly the issues that, that were raised by the committee in their letter were helpful even for us to understand. I mean, the, our role at the central level has been to obviously develop guide, central guidance uh, for each, so that there, and that was developed in October. And then centrally within NICS, we developed um, that, the guidance which has been shared with the committee today. I mean, we have been aware of some issues, and we've asked departments to make us aware of any difficulties and how they're engaging with their committees. Uh, to get that feedback so that we can feed it back into the overall cabinet office uh, position on that as well. There was a few issues, certainly on the transport side, 
Some of it was to do with, um, and I might bring uh, Michael or Stephen in maybe to add a little bit more detail to this, but some of the issues may be even that in some cases a paper is laid as a command paper uh, in the House of Parliament, but they did, the, the policy teams might not have understood what a command paper meant. Um, and I think we do need to keep uh, an eye on this. We need to understand where the guidance isn't being followed. But more importantly, we need to understand what the risk is and the impact of the guidance not being followed, because it's really important that each committee sees the same version of the document and scrutinises the same uh, version of the document. And maybe just to hand over to Michael or Stephen if they I want to add any further on the issues that, uh, that some of the departments might have brought forward so far. Okay. I'm afraid I don't, I don't have an awful lot to, to, to add to what Lorraine has already outlined there. I mean, it is, it's unfortunate that there was those delays and I think we'd apologize for them. I think it, a lot of it was down to unfortunately teething issues. Uh, there was a bit of a lack of communication and misunderstanding of the process because it was the, the first couple that were going through. Um, I think there was a few cases where policy teams were expecting a bit more notice um, to or the, the process of, for, of laying the command paper within the UK Parliament pro progressed a lot more quickly than policy teams here expected it to, so they were caught on the hop. So as, as Lorraine's outlined, um, you know, we've engaged with departments again on the guidance and we're trying to understand all the issues that there's been so that we can um, so rectify them for the next time happens. Okay, that's grand. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask uh, if Doug Beatty is the deputy chair, if he has any questions for this section. Hello, Doug. Sure, no, I, I'm okay. Thank you. I was just listening. I have no questions. Thanks. Okay, then I'll pass to Martina Anderson. Martina, if we can get you into the spotlight, then we can get you to ask yep, a question. That's Okay. Yep, that's me and Chair. And uh, Chair, obviously there's a crossover between uh, the Brexit briefing that we got prior to this and, and this one, but I wanted to take an opportunity when, when Tim was in the room, given the, his new role in the North South Ministerial Council. To, um, Chair, I'm a bit concerned about there being a serious democratic deficit issue because of how some of these were rushed through. And we as a committee, I think for the last six months and more, have had regular updates and discussions and have been flagging up um, what these common frameworks might mean or trying to ascertain what they do mean. So the, the interim arrangements in place from the 1st of January until the final frameworks um, are agreed, um, I'm just wanting to, to know a little bit more about what they are. Um, it surprises me a little bit that the policy team was uh, was uh, very much caught on the hop uh, because we as a committee have been a bit focused on this and have been flagging them up as issues that we would need to be scrutinising. So I just make that point, but I know it's not just this committee. It's These are, these are matters that are affecting all committees. So... Can I can I ask in terms of for a little bit more information around the interim arrangements that have been put in place from the 1st of January? They're going to be in place until the final frameworks are agreed. And if that is the case, then the three not agreed that was referred to, I didn't really hear what they were. So if we could get some information on the three that was mentioned that were not yet or have not yet been agreed to. Yes, no problem. Um, if I maybe bring Stephen in just on the process, uh, you know, the stage four and stage five process and where we're going to next. I mean, it's fair to say that they, we had to change the process as we went through the year um, because it was recognised that we could, wouldn't be able to get all of these frameworks in place. And because of the major cross-cutting issues that would affect the final form of the framework, so these are, at this stage, outline frameworks which will move on to further development, um, including the scrutiny process as well. And it's really important, our role in this at this stage is to make sure now there is agreement on the future relationship and also on the protocol, because we need to remember that the future relationship will interact with the protocol. They're not two separate 
um, agreements, and that's one of the things that we're undertaking at present, is to understand how both those impact. So there is considerable work for us to do in this in relation to making sure that the um, that, that that those factors are understood centrally uh, in the in the structures that we sit in, and then making sure that our departments are challenging those as well through their individual engagement at their policy level. So if maybe I could just bring Stephen in to talk about the uh, you know the phase four and, and phase five uh, and what you would expect to see during this year for their development. Absolutely, Chair, and thank you, Lorraine, for that. Um, I think to say that the phase three was obviously brought forward to make sure that not having any certainty or surety with regards to the content of any negotiated outcome, that we would have working arrangements in place to make sure that there were, there were no policy issues uh, at the end of the, the transition period. And yes, we totally accept that the information that's contained in the framework uh, outline agreements um, do have gaps, and those gaps will be filled uh, as we progress through their further development for this this year ahead uh, through phases four and phases five. Uh, and of course, whilst there will be empirical uh, research and work being undertaken at policy official level, uh, this will be informed also by further stakeholder stakeholder engagement, and also, of course, through engagement with with the committees and their feedback and input to, to the process. So it's making sure that as, as we move forward, that uh, all of the outworkings of the, the protocol, of the, the, the agreement and of the Internal Market Act uh, have been fully taken into account before there's any further endorsement, either at sectoral or, or departmental ministerial level uh, or before anything's brought back to JMCEN for, for endorsement through, through that forum. Um, can I just chair? I think it's something we just need to be mindful of because the outline and provisional common framework, and I think you should recognise this, Stephen, uh, from our point of view as MLAs, the scrutiny role um, has been very challenging if not impossible, given the time frame, obviously, the Jews were working in. But we just need to be kept abreast of it. Can I ask, Chair, I think I should have asked this at the last session, but given uh, that you're still here, maybe I could ask for the committee to be kept informed around the joint consultative working group. But the membership of that, Chair, um, it was one of the questions I should have asked, asked about what sectors in the north will be involved in terms of, or will they, is the question, or will businesses be involved, will uh, civil society be involved, will trade unions be involved, or is it just uh, civil servants and, and experts from, from that field? It was just something they should have asked earlier. Sorry, Chair. No, that, that's okay, and I think it would be important to get the response as well, because I think we would have expected that um, that we would have expected that to be populated by this stage, given that we're, we're into all of these sectors being impacted, but they've got no voice to be able to articulate what their views are. So, Lorraine, is there some indication of the various sectors that will be involved in that? No, um, as I said just in the previous session, there's still, um, negotiate, oh, well, there's still negotiations, I think, between the UK and the EU on, on what the uh, Joint Consultative Working Group will look like. And we have certainly been asking the question i think there's a certain amount of you know december was so intense in relation to all the decisions that needed to be taken on the protocol and and getting the future relationship um the you know the, the future relationship agreement in there that uh, it's almost like everybody's just gone right okay we need to take a breath and where do we go next but there's huge amount of work to do in terms of how we join all the as i said in the last session as well how we join all these governance structures together um, for and how they all interact because there are interdependencies between them. So one of the things we, we would like to consider is how a common framework, if it falls within the scope of the protocol um, and it, uh, there's the EU decides to change regulation in that, how do we um, work that through the Joint Consultative Working Group? How does that interact with the Internal Market Act? How does that work with the Office of the Internal Market? How does the common framework deal with the divergence within there? So I would say that we have identified the issues and, and we're aware of what we need to do, but there's a lot, there's not a lot of clarity so far on how these governance structures will work, but they are on our radar in terms of both our involvement and how we would need to influence in, in, those, in those groups. 
Um, and as I say, I don't think you could underestimate how all these things interact with each other. Yeah, certainly. I, I think it could almost... I appreciate it's not your work, it's further up the line, uh, even uh, between the, the EU and, and the UK, but I suppose it almost sounds a little bit like trying to work out which comes first, the chicken or the egg, whenever there's no chicken or egg. And, and it's just it's very difficult for those on, on the ground that are being impacted by something, but they have no method to be able to interact and articulate those concerns or request those changes in a formalised way. And that does fall back a little to what we had said uh, with Tim earlier. There, there may be a number of informal ways of being able to engage and, and highlight where the problems are, but if it fundamentally requires agreement between the EU and the UK to be able to change something. If there's no formalised method of getting that on an agenda, that does leave a bit of a deficit. But hopefully, as the weeks roll by, there will be uh, some population of those those groups and some structures put in place. I, I, Chair, sorry, can, yes, I, can I just, sorry, one wee small thing insofar as it is small. Um, the, the TEO, our, our committee in terms of the executive office, is carrying out the quality treatment legislation, the common framework um, that is, is responsible for, and that falls within the TEO committee. So um, I, thought the common, I thought that the quality treatment was covered by the protocol, so I'm just a little bit confused uh, where that is residing. Lorraine, we, uh, we, yeah, we, I think we have a yeah. sense of an update on that, is there? Um, I think that one is currently with ministers, as far as I know. Um, I was, could bring Michael in, who, who would know where nearly all of them are. Um, Michael, do you have, have we an update on that? But I think that one is currently under consideration by ministers. Um, okay. As Lorraine says, it, it's with ministers for consideration. Um, it's one yeah. that with the, the equality policy team or equality director within TEO rather than within our team. Yeah. Okay, so Chair, we should get a time frame as to when the committee will get sight of that. Yeah, I think so, because I think maybe, um, Martina, there's been some suggestion that that may have been been getting dropped and, and not coming to ourselves. So maybe what we'll do is if we write formally to the department and ask for an update on it, then we'll, we'll get the clarity that's needed if that uh, we, we can do that. Um, Okay, in the absence of any other members indicating that they wish to, to speak, I think we can, can call it, bring it to an end, this section. Uh, can I thank Lorraine for, for presenting in both sessions and to Stephen and Michael for uh, coming on to this. I appreciate we were a bit delayed, so apologies if that's in, interrupted your day there, but thank you very much for coming along for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, if you... Bear with. I think next we can move all the members up into the spotlight, which brings everybody back on board again. Um, and I suppose maybe what I could do at that stage is just ask, is there any member that wants to raise any issue? Because I appreciate that you were, were maybe not able to, to indicate. Is there anybody that wants to raise any issues on the back of the presentations? Uh, George, I'm seeing the palm of your hand there. So you're either giving me money or you're indicating that you want to speak there. Chair, just to say that um, I've, been, I've been here at the, the full presentations yes. from the beginning and uh, I couldn't get on whenever Arlene and uh, Michelle were there. It's, uh, two or three questions for them, but possibly maybe due, due to my own fault, I'm not quite sure, but just to say, that, just to record that I've been at the meeting. Okay, absolutely. I think difficulty, George, is you need to use the raise hand function, which indicates on the screen for me that you want to ask a question, um, because we were having various technical problems earlier of calling calling people in. But but look, we noted that you were there the whole way through, but we won't call you in for a question. You'll need to, to hit that raise hand function so that we can see on the screen that you're, you're looking to come in. Yeah, to be honest, I did do that a couple of times. Yes, well, we'll get you up to date with that, and that will keep things going smoothly. But we have, definitely we have you recorded as being here for the meeting. Okay, okay, thank you very much for that, Chair. Members, we'll move on then to item seven, and if you just bear with me for the next few bits, we'll rattle through what we have to do. Uh, in terms of the forward work programme, which is on page 325 of the meeting pack, uh, are you content to note the forward work programme? 
Yep. Okay. I think we maybe uh, there might be one or two changes just to try and facilitate things. And I have sort of we, we discussed earlier. Myself and Michael are trying to iron it out that we only have two presentations on a day and not three, because I appreciate we're now just approaching the third hour of today's meeting, and that's that, that can be tough enough. Um, on page uh, 330, there is correspondence from the, the Senate Special Select Committee on the withdrawal from the UK and the European Union, which is inviting the committee to take part in the meeting with them uh, in uh, January to discuss the Brexit issues. You'll know we've done a number of these uh, with the House of Lords and with the Dáil in the past period. Are members content that we get that scheduled? I think we see the space as being maybe the first week of February uh, or second week of February for that. Would members be OK if we arrange that? Okay. Item eight is correspondence. There are 16 items of correspondence uh, in the meeting pack. Uh, item 8.5 on page 338 is correspondence from the Minister of Finance, which was forwarded by the Committee of Finance, indicating the delay in consideration of the draft budget. Item 8.6 of the meeting pack is correspondence from the Committee of Justice to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, asking for clarification on how the statutory duty of the Commissioner for Victims and Survivors has been carried out with regard to the establishment of the Troubles Permanent Disablement Pension Scheme, given the current vacancy. So the committee has asked, uh, the Justice Committee has asked if our committee uh, would keep it informed on the issue as the Department of Justice has a role in establishing the scheme. So can I suggest that any future briefings or communication from the Executive Office in relation to this issue are shared with the Committee for Justice? Okay, I agree on there. Uh, there's correspondence at 8.7 on page 341 from the Committee for Health to the Department of Health and open a request by that committee to ask for regular briefings from an Executive Office official in relation to future health protection regulations. Are members content for the committee to write to the First and Deputy First Minister supporting the request from the, Depart the Committee for Health? And um, then are members content to note the rest of the items on the agenda? Great. Okay. Great. Chair, yes, Chair we're, Martin here. Yes, of course, going ahead. Uh, Chair, just sorry, I didn't know what way you were doing them and then when you were running through the first one. So I just want to go back to the issue of the budget. Yes, of course. Um, and the communication that we've had. Because um, we're hearing reports that um, the budget, the discussion in the budget was uh, blocked from being discussed in the executive. And that's going to impact on the consultation and planning of the, of the draft budget. And if it has got to do with anything as is being suggested about EU funding, um, because that the economy minister has very late in the day discovered that there's 100 million being lost to her department. There's 25 million the Department of Infrastructure. There's hundreds of millions for CAP funding. And then you have European Social Fund. But it goes back to the point that I was making earlier and asking the ministers around this, this shared prosperity fund, because surely we should be looking to the British government for that. Because uh, as we were promised, EU funding was going to be, uh, wasn't going to be lost. So I'm concerned that this is now being used as some kind of a barter and maybe blocking the paper from going on the executive before Christmas. If that is true, then it's going to cut down on our scrutiny time and the consultation and the planning for the budget. And I think um, I would like to express our concern about that. OK, thank you, Martina. Maybe could I suggest then, given that obviously the 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 budget comes from the Department of Finance, but it does impact right across the executive, and the executive office would have uh, some sort of uh, scope on that. Maybe that we would write to the First and Deputy First Minister and ask for an urgent update uh, on the budget process, uh, and you know, highlighting that we feel it will impact all committees in their capacity to be able to scrutinise the budget uh, in good time, and to ask for a, a timetable of when it will be delivered. Um, would that be? Yeah, well, absolutely, Chair, but particularly because of the reports that's been suggested that it is actually the First Minister that's holding it up. Well, absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll seek that, that, that clarity, so we'll, we'll send that off. Um, OK, members happy enough with that as an outcome? OK, then we can move on to item nine, which is Chairman's Business. 
Um, maybe if I could just update members that myself and the Deputy Chair met with all the representatives of the HIA groups earlier today. Just to, to, It was on the back of our last meeting we were asked to do that. Um, there were quite a number of similar issues raised by all of the various groups uh, and the recommendation is that myself and the uh, Deputy Chair will meet with the uh, clerk and look at the, the minutes from that and uh, as a note in terms of what the issues are and what we feel the next step would be and we'll hopefully get that presented to members next week and then the following week we have the commissioner in as well and then we'll be able to tie all that together after that meeting. Would that be agreeable to members? Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to say this one and then duck. Uh, item 10, any other business? Members, we had said in October that we agreed to scheduling a professional development workshop on effective questioning and questioning skills in early 2021. Would members be content if we schedule that for somewhere in February and then time permitting we'll get ourselves on for that? Okay, I'm going quick before anybody gets to unmute themselves. And then move myself on to uh, item 11. The date, time and uh, place of the next meeting will be here next week at two o'clock. And if members are content, we'll adjourn the meeting there. And thank you very much for your attendance and perseverance through a long session today. But thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.